Hello, fiends, and welcome to the Monster Party Podcast, now a part of the Fangoria Podcast Network. For more information about the network, including other programs, how to follow the show, and find past episodes of Monster Party, please visit Fangoria.com. And now, it's party time. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to yet still another edition of Monster Party. Monster Party. Monster Party. Monster Party. (laughs) And this this is going to be exciting. No, I I had one more. (laughs) No, I hate it when you do that. I hate it, but because I'm very excited about this particular show. I'm excited too, Larry. As a matter of fact, I want to get to this. Me too. And who are you? I want to get to things. I am Matt Weinhold. I am Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Stroth. And I'm James Gonis. Sean, I think you are, should be the one to introduce well, our fabulous topic yeah, slash right. guest. Our guest yes. is our topic this week, and uh-huh. um, I'm very excited about this. this You're so a, excited. This is a gentleman who is a writer, a director, yes. actor. Yes. I would say an avid cinephile. Yes. Uh, Big time. Uh, exploitation film guru. He knows so um, much. Um, and also the creator and owner of one of the coolest DVD Blu-ray companies. We'll talk about that Yes. Also. Please, everybody, say hello to William Lustig. Yeah. William Lustig! Thank you so much for being here, Thanks sir. Thanks for making the scene, man. Well, yeah. thank you for inviting me. Oh, man. There's so much to talk about. There, there is, is a lot to talk about. You have touched our lives in so many ways. You have no idea. <laughs> yeah, but oh. it, there was a way that was kind of disturbing, though. Well, I, were... I like those things. <laughs> you see, I like I, to be okay. disturbed and touched. Oh, my gosh. Well, um, let's kind of, I want to start, Bill, if we can, like, a little bit at the beginning as far as... Because I know that you kind of grew up in New York. Yeah. Right? yeah. And you, you kind of lived on a diet of 42nd Street grindhouse movies and stuff, right? Talk well, about that. you know, I, I started to really get into movies and thinking about it as a life profession yeah. when I was around, I think, 12, 12 yeah. years old. Mm-hmm. Right. I was just hooked on movies like the James Bond movies mm-hmm. and the World War II films and the horror films of any kind. A lot of the Hammer films, things like that. And I used to go to school actually depressed because I would think, why am I here? I want to be out making movies. <laughs> right. and, I, and I remember at one time, I just have a very vivid memory of like banging my forehead on the desk in front of me <laughs> going, why am I here? I want to be out. And this is like I'm 13, 14 years old maybe. And I really wanted to be making movies. And, um, and I used to go to the library. I, I, I grew up I was born in the Bronx, but I grew up, my teen years were in New Jersey, right across the George Washington Bridge mm-hmm. in a town called Englewood Cliffs. And I used to go to the public library and take out books on filmmaking and would sit there after school, wow. not doing my schoolwork, but mm-hmm. actually reading very sophisticated books about <clears throat> filmmaking and filmmakers. Mm-hmm. Right. And anything I could get my hands on, I would do. I, I would even, there was a, I'll never forget this, there was a, uh, in New York, there was a, a, a equipment rental house called Camera Mart. And I, I can't even believe to this day that they let me do this, but when I was a young kid, I'd go in there and buy a magazine, and I still get it every month, American Cinematographer. Oh, yeah. Sure, yeah. And I would read it cover to cover, and learning about lenses, learning about ca- you know equipment, things like that. And the only place to buy it was at this camera rental place called Camera Mart. And one day, one of the people there said, you know, would you like to go in back and kind of look at the equipment itself? And, and, and they did. And I went back, and they allowed me to handle... The equipment. Wow. Wait, how old were you? Fourteen? Yeah, thirteen, fourteen. They let years you old. it touched their equipment? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. No, they because they, they saw me all the time going there every month buying yeah, American cinema. Right. I even bought the cinematographer's handbook. Even though I was oh, I, wow. I was not shooting, yeah. but I wanted to learn about you know uh, everything there was about cinematography and all that kind of stuff. But you had like proven that you're not just some punk off the street. Oh no, or... I was I was perfectly 
there was no reason they had to be concerned about me. Right, right. Were you making your own movies already by no. that age? No, I wasn't. Well, I he's think a, I might have. I think I might have dabbled with a couple of friends doing eight millimeter things. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Right. Nothing yeah. really. Yeah. Nothing. Anything really of any consequence. Well, I was curious. Did any of those? Are they? Were they like creepy films that you did? Um, did I did one which was an axe murder film. Ah, there we go. There I did there do that. Go. Yeah. And I used the score from Dario Argento's *Bird with the Crystal Plumage*. Morricone. <gasps> <gasps> the the, the, uh, the Morricone score. score. Right. Yeah, that that's what scored it. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. You still have that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the funny thing is, I think I I have it. I have a projector, right? But, but right it's, now, but it's not a it's not a composite print. I okay. had a mag track with, uh, you know, so you'd have to sync the mag track with the with the picture. But yeah, it we'll was we have yeah, Bill, no, Bill, Bill Blu-ray, and, and, Blu-ray, and buddy. Come my on. guess is, I, honestly, I didn't store it like in the most temperature controlled situation even right, if i did right. it was still filming yeah, and it's probably mag. faded but i'm right. sure it's still... i'm sure the mag smells like a salad right now <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's uh you know but anyway yeah so i did that and then my uncle is uh jake lamada the yes. raging bull which is amazing right, yeah. Right. Yeah. and he had a friend of his who was dabbling well more than dabbling was making independent film mm-hmm now, he wasn't very good, but he was certainly passionate about making film. And it was kind of interesting because this guy was a mobster. And, oh. um, but he was a, it was, well, made him interesting because he was a real deal mobster, a real mm-hmm. organized crime guy. Jeez. And uh, his name was, uh, well, his stage name was Peter Savage. His real name was Peter Petrola. And if you look at the credits of Raging Bull, it says produced in association with Peter Savage as one of the credits. Because he really was a, as tough and as, and as accomplished as a wise guy this guy was, he was like in awe of my uncle. Even mm-hmm. though my uncle was well retired at this point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he really was on the down and out. Mm-hmm. He had a tremendous amount of respect and admiration for him because of what he had accomplished. And I guess... Pete grew up watching him as a boxer, and oh, wow, you know, wow. and so he, he he was like an idol of his. Anyway, yeah. so that he got behind doing the book, and eventually producing the movie. He was the one who really brought everyone together. Wow, wow. that's yeah. amazing because it's a beautiful, yeah, it's one of the greatest films, films of all time. Yeah. yeah, it is. And I mean, he's the one who attracted De Niro and Scorsese wow. to the project. Cool. After that, of course, it was picked. You know, it was Charlotte Winkler who actually produced the movie, but yeah, it was right. Pete. Mm-hmm who kind of put the elements together and it was short off Winkler who carried the ball at that point. But anyway, getting back to what I was saying is Pete was making independent films and commercially they were terribly misguided. They were really, uh, they were comedies and they yeah. would star like Jane Russell where she was way past being, oh, <laughs> being oh, the star of the film. Oh, no. And Pete had aspirations to act and you know, right. so he would kind of star in his own movies. Sure. Think, wow. He, he was kind of like a Duke Mitchell before Duke Mitchell. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but his movies weren't nearly as as commercial as Duke's were in, right. you know, however commercial you think Duke's movies Was he are. an okay actor? <laughs> you know... You could see him in the beginning of Taxi Driver. I mean, he, oh, he's, okay. he's in the, you remember the a guy in the back of the cab with the hooker? Yeah. He says, oh, yeah, yeah. He says, oh you do all the right things, yeah. you know, I'll take care of you. You know, driver, you know, take, that was a he brief was, scene. He was good in that. Well, but that's Pete. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't exactly stretching. <laughs> right. But um, anyway, so to get to the point is at our family gatherings, you know, holidays and things, Pete often would be there and I would tell Pete and here I am a little snot nosed kid and he's a guy in his I think at the time he must have been in his forties and I would tell him how much I wanted to make movies and and, and we would argue because I would tell him I saw Easy Rider and I thought it was great and, oh. and things like that. <laughs> and you know I would tell him things like this and we would really it was a clash of generations. Right. Oh and yeah. Clearly okay, he and me. I were not in sync. <laughs> but he did recognize my passion and what he did was he opened the doors to people in the industry to let me be a production assistant, oh, to wow. working in an editing room. Wow, that's, um, that's kind of an education. Oh, the yeah. editing room. I, 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 editing room to me was church. Yeah. I could be working in the editing room till all hours. Mm-hmm. I never felt it. It was, I, I, I was in love with editing. 35 millimeter, it just was like where I was at. Yeah. 
And I got so serious about it that when I was in high school, I was put on a program where I could, where I was supposed to go to school, supposed to, <laughs> from <laughs> nine in the morning or eight in the morning until I think it was 12 or one o'clock in the afternoon. And then I would take the bus into New York City where I'd work in editing. And often I would be working in editing until midnight or later. Oh my God. <laughs> and then I was a kid taking the train back to New and bus back to New Jersey. I wouldn't get home till three, two, three o'clock in the morning. Oh my, oh my so God. school suffered, I have yeah. to say. Yeah. Keeping jazz to the point, hours. <laughs> <laughs> to, the po to the point where I never got a high school diploma. I mean, I just I, as soon as I wow. turned it, as soon as I turned 18, I signed I literally on the day I turned 18, I signed myself out of school and I said, that's it. Wow. Really? And, wow. uh, and I worked from that point on full time in the film business. Wow. Um, so, so don't stay in school, kids. Uh, no, no, no. That's not what we're saying. That's not. No, I want to make sure that that's not what we're saying. Uh, well, everyone has a different path. All right. He took this path. Okay. Yeah, all right. All right. If you believe well, in yourself, now, okay, okay. Saying, Bill, where'd you go from here? Right. Well, from here. Okay. So I was working a lot in the editing room, and Pete. At one point, there was a, a producer named Ralph Serpy. Ralph produced, among other films, Mandingo. Oh, oh my God! Uh, wow! Oh and I was God. there when they were putting it together and wow. they were in pre-production. I didn't work on the movie. It was shot, I think, in Louisiana or Georgia or something. Uh -huh. But the one film that Ralph did put me on as a production assistant was a movie called Across 110th Street. Oh, yeah. Across 110th Street. Yeah, you know that Cotto? Anthony Quinn. Pardon? Yafet Cotto. Yafet Cotto uh -huh. and Anthony, Anthony Quinn. Franci Anthony Quinn. Anthony Franciosa. It was a terrific movie. Um, it turned out to be a really terrific movie. It was a very difficult shoot yeah uh, it was all shot on location in mm -hmm. harlem yeah. until uh they could no longer do that yeah uh do, and, do you know what the date on that it was and at that time was that i like want to say 71 71 yeah. 72 yeah, okay yeah, it was okay. around 71 72 uh -huh. i was probably i i wasn't driving so i was 16 okay okay i wasn't driving yeah, yeah. i didn't get my driver's license yet sure and it was uh exciting i was hooked as as tough and as rough sure. as it was and it was. <laughs> and what was tough about it? Well, it was... Well, he's a PA. I was a PA working on a very difficult location, dangerous. Oh, yeah. Harlem wasn't Harlem of today. Right. There yeah. was no Bill Clinton's office up there. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. So it was It's like a tough... It was a tough neighborhood, man. It was, Come on. A, it was yeah. a tough hey. place. Come on. And, um, I'm in addition, for details, my friend. In addition, there was uh, was a lot of location shooting. Mm -hmm. okay. And it was shooting in, you know, really, really, uh, you know bad places you know mm -hmm. just difficult difficult tenements things like that yeah. I, and uh, but i was so i was learning i was yeah. learning how to how, this is how you make a movie yeah well anyway around this time there was the success a uh, big success of the movie deep throat mm. And that, that's and, know yes. it well and, okay and, okay that's an x-rated movie and it became the gold rush to make the new deep throat uh, right. and and of course, Pete was attracted to that idea. He uh, he uh, decided, okay, I, I failed as an independent making, trying to make family movies, in yeah. mainstream films, things yeah. like that. He don't. He didn't contact Jane Russell for this. No, <laughs> did not contact. Right, okay, me. okay. So he dove into the adult business, right. Got it. and it's so funny because the first adult film I worked on. It was called Hypnerotica when we shot it. I, Hip great title. Hypnerotica. Great title, yeah. Hypnerotica, but it wasn't released as Hypnerotica on video. I think it's called The Hypnotist or Hypnotized. And, <laughs> Not as good. No, Sorry. no, no. no, no and, um, and so anyway, a few months ago, Alpha Blue put it out. <gasps> oh, and wow. I, I picked up a copy of it, and I watched it. And I'm going, oh, my God. It was like a, a – I, I remember – like it was yesterday. Wow. wow. All the location, where we were, <laughs> oh and the, when we were doing this and that. It was just like, and this was like, it had to be like, no, I drove. So it was 72. Okay. Wow. I was, yeah, because I had to drive some people. Yeah, it was 72. And it really uh, <laughs> was interesting. But, but so you got into the whole kind of adult film stuff then. Right? Well, I, you know what it was? It, yeah. The funny thing is, Yes, it was adult. It was adult movies, but they were shot like regular movies. Right, it was right. The days in of fact, Orange Chic. In yeah. fact, the crew that worked on Hypnotized—I'll never forget it. 
they were telling me, they were bitching and moaning about a film they had just finished shooting and telling me how difficult it was. And yeah. and they were bitching because they kind of worked as a team. Right. And they were talking about how uh, cheap the producer was and, and how they were shooting on what were called short ends. In other words, they weren't getting the, 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 the budget to the buy whole, a full new roll of yeah, film. Right. They would <laughs> right. buy the ends that yeah. the studios would sell to a, right. to a broker. And that film was Superfly. Wow. No. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. Black exploitation classic. Right. Yeah. But yeah. super. But I. It hadn't come out at that point because right. yeah. right. they had just finished shooting it. And then I go to see the movie. I go, this film. These guys. They were bitching. But this movie's great. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a great, great movie. And these guys were so disparaging. They were talking about, oh, you know, they were real pimps and, and <laughs> oh, you know, and, and drug dealers. They were doing drugs all over the place, and you know, and. I'm it sure was it's a not, magical time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'm sure it's not the first time that's well, happened. Well, the but. crew was not like a young, hip crew, you know? Because right. back then in the film business, there there wasn't really a lot of young people yeah. in that the film business. That generation hasn't really come, come yeah. It kind of really came up yet. around the same time I did. Remember, you know, it was, it was a generation out of touch with what they were shooting. Okay. Right, right. Yeah, so I worked on that, and then I went back and forth from working on adult and also working on, you know, as a production assistant on mainstream. I worked, as an example, the next one I did was a movie called Crazy Joe. I don't know if you guys ever saw it. I no, that I one. don't know. It, it, it starred Peter Boyle playing oh, Crazy was, Joe uh, Gallo. Was it John G. Abelson? Oh, no, it wasn't that's... Abelson. It was it was directed by uh, the director was um, I'll tell you right now it's coming to me. So this is different uh, than the Abelson. Oh yeah, one. no, this is not the Abelson one, okay. the, which is called Joe. Joe, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. This was Crazy Joe. Fun, funny enough, starring Peter Boyle. Wow, wow. Right. and it was directed by what the hell was his name? I know the the DP was Aldo Tanti. Because only used... we had a device. <laughs> <laughs> I see somebody is finding it. Carlo Lizzani. Carlo Lizzani. <laughs> Carlo Lizzani was oh. the director. It was produced by De Laurentiis and Rob Serpy. At that time of making Crazy Joe, De Laurentiis was going to make Raging Bull. He was uh-huh. going to produce Raging Bull, and Ralph Serpy was going to be the actual on set producer. And it, it didn't come to fruition because of De Niro. And the only reason the deal fell apart was the insistence on De Niro and Scorsese to shut down production for six weeks to allow De Niro to gain weight. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. And right. during that, that was- six weeks, they paid the crew to keep him. Oh, wow. And trying to convince a producer like De Laurentiis, right, you know, right. I could see, I could see, I wasn't there, but I could picture the meeting. <laughs> yeah. well, what, what, what do you mean? You want to shut down production for six weeks and we pay the crew for six weeks doing nothing well, but Niro, sitting home. While De Niro eats a lot. While De Niro gains <laughs> weight. I'm, I'm surprised. My you, question can, is... Can you please repeat this to me again? <laughs> like he needs, he can, needs six weeks? Yeah. <laughs> I can do it in two. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, can't we? Sh- maybe I can see him. Maybe we shoot another movie during those six weeks. <laughs> yeah, and then right. That way we use the crew. Yeah. <laughs> Let's remake Bucket of Blood. Right. Yeah. We, do know, so- they- we do something, but to, 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 but to keep the crew for six weeks and pay them is, you know, just sort of short circuit. I mean, his- right. that's what Corman would do, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 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 I can't, you know, well, an extra week he does no, a whole look, movie. I, well, <laughs> I can't blame De- Well, right. you have to think yeah. of, like, De Laurentiis definitely, he probably never met Roger Corman. Yeah. But he definitely was cut from the same cloth. Yeah. Only yeah, making sure. different films. Right, mm-hmm. right. I mean, they both were prolific. Yeah. But while Roger Corman f- focused on drive ins yeah. and America and right, American right. themes, De Laurentiis was making films for the world. Yeah. He was trying right. universally. Yeah. Yeah. He was making films because that's how he financed his movies by pre selling them right. around right. the world. Right. Right. Anyway, to get back to it, uh, so I worked on Crazy Joe, and uh, then there was maybe one or two other. Oh, um, oh! Before that, there was. Uh, that's where I met Joe Spinell, Seven Ups. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering where the connection was. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 one of the greatest, yeah. of course, yeah. car chases of all time, right. which is something you do very well. As oh, oh yeah, fantastic. Well, and we'll, which actually, we'll, we'll get to that because it yeah, really yeah. surprised me in some yeah. of these movies well, that you did. So when it came to like by 1980. Was Maniac pretty much your first straight horror mainstream mainstream film, right? Oh, yeah. And tell us how that came about, because you obviously got to know Spinell really well. Joe Spinell, who's just one of the greatest character actors ever. He was in, he was in The Godfather. He was in so everything. He's, he's, and a lot of New York so stuff. He was, driver. Joe Spinell and other actors and people who worked with him will tell you this, and it's not because he 
he he's now lo- no longer with us and we think back it, it, he was a great actor mm, absolutely. he yeah. was truly if you look at the breadth of his work the, the the diversity of the characters he played besides playing of course mobsters to the t mm-hmm. but he played all other kinds of characters and he did it so well if you look at for instance the movie stay hungry or you know, ninety two in the shade and yeah. movies like this. He just was across the board, one of the most versatile, great character Absolutely. actors. Yeah. Magnetic, like you yeah. can't, you really can't take your and, eyes off. And him. so natural, too. yes. Like, just he just slid right into whatever role. He could do anything, and he was loved by the crew. Yeah, in New York, they loved him. Scorsese, you know, anybody, uh, they, everybody loved Joe, and they I, all respected him. I heard a story, I don't know if it was one of the DVDs, but it was that Coppola loved him so much that Spinell was on the set almost the entire time for The Godfather, yes. even when he was not acting, yeah. so he got paid like really well, because wow. Coppola's well, that's nice. No. But, you know, okay, now, I know you guys can't imagine this, but there was a time <laughs> before computers. When, <laughs> no, when, I, oh, I, I can know. remember. I can remember. <laughs> come on, yeah, yeah. come on. Um, anyway, going back to the Stone Age, uh, <laughs> back back in the time of The Godfather, they were doing accounting the old-fashioned white pencils and erasers and yeah. uh, right. sure. pieces of paper. And... When Joe was hired for The Godfather, he was only supposed to work a few days. And so as an actor, he was put on what's called a day rate. Yeah. Right. A day rate contract. If you were expected to work, say, for more than a couple of days, let's say for a week or two, you'd be put on a weekly contract. Yeah. And if you're like the other main actors in The Godfather working the run of the show, you're put on what's called a Schedule F, which is a flat fee to be there for the entire movie. Mm-hmm. Well, what happened with Joe is he was signed as a day player. And what happened was Coppola, as you said, kept him around because Joe, he was great with the actors. Yeah. He knew the turf. Mm-hmm. Coppola loved him. Mm-hmm. And he was kept around even when he wasn't working. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, he's racking up day rates, yes. which are much <laughs> higher, yeah. by the way, Be- than, right, than a weekly than, and a monthly. Yes. Unfortunately, yeah. than weekly and monthly on a proportionate basis. I, I think eventually they caught it. <laughs> but, but he, at that point, he was he had maybe made as much as say some of these people like Pacino made. Oh, wow. it was, That's crazy. And his residuals were humongous. Yeah, wow. I cashed. Joe had a problem with the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe had a thing where when he would go on a job, he'd write down on his, uh, what do you call it, the W-9, he'd write down he had 99 dependents. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and it finally caught up to him. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, he thought he was getting free money. No, yeah. No. Never works. So at the point when flashing forward many years, I uh, he would get his residual checks. And one of his residual checks on Godfather was like, Sixteen thousand dollars, and it's wow. like it's like it was like unbelievable. Especially back then, too. I mean, yeah. Like, yeah, amazing. And I, yeah, and I was having to, I, I have to take him to my corner bank where I had my business account in, and convinced them. I said, "Look, it's Paramount Pictures, you know. Yes. Yeah, you know, it's a good check." And, oh and they would, gosh. and they, and the guy at the bank at that point had kind of known Joe. Yeah, and they cashed it. And Joe would walk around with sixteen thousand cash. Oh Man, oh but yeah, that's but, but he walking would, around money. But he wrote, didn't he write? Mania? Well, yeah, because uh, 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 I'm going to set the, st- the, cl- yeah, the so, climate, the stage here. Yeah. Was, this was like the slasher boom was had just kind of broke in a way. I mean, Halloween, Friday the Thirteenth. True. So, like, well, we- actually, Friday the Thirteenth came after we shot Maniac. Oh, okay. Wow. Wow. okay, yeah, okay, yeah, because we hired Tom on the set of Friday the Thirteenth. Oh, wow. So well, he, he went do- from the set in New Jersey of Friday the Thirteenth to New York to do Maniac. Oh my gosh. Okay, so wow. tell us. I know that yeah, Spinell How- wrote Maniac and. Because, you know, Maniac has become this kind of well, pillar of influence. Yeah. Well, this, 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 and how did this whole thing come together? Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, as you guys know, because you're into horror, and, and obviously you guys live together. I don't want to ask. <laughs> yeah, we well, do. We have oh, hammocks. No. no I don't no, want to. We are we the monkeys of no, We podcasts. do not know. But you know, you know <laughs> that when horror, when horror people meet, there is... An immediate bond. Yes. Oh, yeah. About with horror people. Oh, you remember this movie? And I, oh, God, I gotta, you know, I want to see this, and I'm gonna go. You know, and and, and it, there was immediate bond. Joe Spinell was a horror fan. 
Hmm. A true horror fan. Oh, awesome. nice. I didn't know that. Yeah, he I didn't know that either. He loved horror movies. Like all, all kinds, all, all eras? Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, he just loved horror movies. He he went to see them as a kid and, and loved them and loved the idea of wanting to star in his own horror film. Uh-huh. So, for, so for many years before we made Maniac, we were trying to get from, I would say, I want to say from about 74, 75, we were trying to develop scripts Mm -hmm. and things. We had one which was about a father and son serial killer team, which could still be a good movie. That's good. I like that. It was actually based on a true story um, of a father and son, New Jersey. I think I read it in New York Magazine or something. New Jersey. and and, And we developed the script on it. But, you know, we could never raise the money. You okay. just could not do it. <laughs> right. And so I'm, here's the pitch. <laughs> Father and son serial killers. Okay. Well, it, it, it probably wasn't so much the subject matter than I just did not have the credentials. Right. right. Even though I was working on, I had done an adult movie that was very successful, it still did not translate into even a guy like Corman giving the money right. to make a movie, yeah. you know, right. to, to sure. give us the money to make a movie. They just didn't, there was no belief. And of course, it didn't help that I was in New York and the independent business, for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, was based in Los Angeles. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'd never been to Los Angeles in my life, so I, I, you know, totally alien country. So anyway, we just got to a point where we just kind of ran out of steam. You know, I was I, I had made a, a second adult film, which I didn't want to do. Mm-hmm. I did it because just to keep working and right. to keep sure. moving, Pay the bills. moving forward. Yeah, yeah. So what we just decided to do out of just pure frustration is we had this idea. <laughs> it started with the idea of doing a, a, a serial killer movie where the character is a compilation of various ser- serial killers from that period. Okay, mm-hmm. That was the concept. And sure. then I had the idea that we would do these kind of Dario Argento-esque set pieces Mm -hmm. and then there would be a cop a detective who was chasing him Mm -hmm. okay Mm -hmm. with that we went to a writer who had written a lot of police movies and he said no i don't want to do it but my wife you know wants to be a screenwriter so we gave her a shot at writing it and you know she wrote basically a very conventional cop chasing a serial killer type movie very very conventional but we we were moving forward Joe got the commitment of Jason Miller to play the cop, wow. Jason Miller from The Exorcist. Wow. And it was going to be Jason Miller and, and Joe. Yeah. And I got Dario Argento, who I had worked on a couple of his New York sequences. Of uh, I worked on the in New York sequences of Inferno and Tenebrae. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, man. So I had a relationship with Argento, and I got Argento's commitment to put in a little bit of money into the movie. Wow, yeah. And, and we got Goblin committed to do the score. Awesome. None of which, by the way, came to and his, right, wife, yeah, yeah. and his wife daria nicoloni was going to play what became the caroline moreau part wow. that was that's how originally it was wow those were the pieces of the original puzzle yeah well of course as things go everything fell apart <laughs> um, oh we know <laughs> and, and in frustration i decided i had just gotten a little bit of money in from the adult films so i had about $30,000, which was all the money I had in the world. I had $30,000. My childhood friend, who I'd worked with on some of these movies as a co-production manager, Andrew Garoni, uh, he worked also on Inferno and Tenebrae and many other movies. Uh, he had 12000 And Joe Spinell, who was shooting Cruising at that moment, wow. uh, got a check for 6000 from Cruising. So with a grand total of $48,000 in the bank, we said, we're going out and making our movie. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Now, Whoa. we knew that we didn't have enough money to finish the movie. Uh-huh. <laughs> but it's a funny thing when you're 24. The one beautiful thing when you're 24 is being fearless. Mm. Sure. Right. You don't care. Yeah. All you see is, I got to get this, and I'm going to make it happen. Yeah. And thinking back to it, it was pretty risk. It was a very risky thing to do, mm-hmm. but it didn't seem that way at the sure. time. Mm-hmm. It was sort of like everything we're in, we're in on everything. We're going to do this. We're going to make mm-hmm. this happen. And my feeling was, when the train left the station, other people would want to jump on board. Right. And I was right. And again, it was you know in this business serendipity rules. 
Joe had done a movie with Caroline called Star Crash. Oh, <gasps> which I love. I love, I yeah. love that movie. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things about Joe is, um, just as a, a side note, is uh, Joe is very protective of the actresses. Mm. I mean, he's as big a lecher as anybody, but when it came to, his, <laughs> came to the actresses, he was like really protective. And in Italy, it, they were shooting Star Crash. It was the winter. And the studios in Italy are made of marble. Mm -hmm. And they don't shoot sync sound. They, they shoot a scratch track. Right, right. And, and later it's all dubbed. Right. Anyway. Caroline was wearing next to nothing. Yes, yes. yes. And we know. I, I, haven't, I, haven't, I didn't notice. Yeah, no. and, come on. And and it was winter, and, oh, and, oh, and there wasn't always a dedicated wardrobe person that when the director yelled cut, they would run over and put a coat oh, or right. something yeah. on right, her. Right. Yeah. And Joe became like, I'm not coming to work anymore until there is somebody standing by to keep Caroline warm. Aww. I cannot work this way. She's got to be kept warm. That's awesome. And Would he, he just wrap her in that big yeah, he has a cloak cape. that he, has he had? <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm sure he did a couple of times. <laughs> the, uh, the thing was is they bonded. Uh -huh. right, so right. When she Car seems like the sweetest person. Yeah, she is. She is. We've seen her at conventions. Yeah, absolutely. She's, she's as sweet as sugar. Mm -hmm. At the time, she had a lun uh, lunatic husband. Oh, but and he's in Star Crash too, right? Isn't he? Or he might. Judd is Hamilton he, is he, he the robot or something? Or may, I don't know. Could maybe, be. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, but uh, she had a husband that was uh, that was uh, right, yeah. yeah. kind of a uh, big star eighty. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad no, it didn't well. go that. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad that she yes. got out of that. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Anyway, so he met so, her on yeah, Star Crash. Yeah. So cut two. We're in New York. We're in production. Daria Nicolotti had dropped out. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, she was doing an Italian TV movie, and, and so she was not available. And we're broke anyway. We have no money. We're really <laughs> just running on fumes. And uh, so Caroline and Joe met at a Fangoria convention oh, wow. in New York. Just, you know, Joe went there with Tom sure. Savini to say hi and, yeah. you know, and socialize with Caroline. And know. he had known Tom Savini previous to this? No, he didn't. We he all did met Tom for the first time on the movie. Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah. So Joe tells, you know, what are you doing? We're yeah. making a movie called Maniac. Our co-star dropped out. Would you like the part? No. <laughs> Your office of the part. And then, of course, uh, then the next thing, her husband is there. And, oh. and it's like, oh, wow. and we say, well... We don't have any money. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're completely out of money. Yeah. And the husband said, I'll get you the money. Wow. <gasps> no. And he did. Damn. He wow. got us, he got us, uh, it was, I believe it was 75000 oh No God. way. He got us 75000 which allowed us to finish shooting the film. Uh-huh. And getting it to completion, but That's he awesome. brought in he brought in an investor for seventy five thousand mm -hmm. dollars, wow. and that was that. He brought, he got an investor. We started shooting, and uh, we brought we shot all the scenes with Carolyn, yeah, and finished the movie, and it was a big success. It's interesting you say the some of the previous versions of the script were like a cop chasing him and all that, because what separates Maniac from all the other slasher movies of the time, yeah, is like. You know, most of the movies take the point of view of like the final girl or the horny teenagers or the yeah. cop or the cop or yeah. detective yeah. chasing. The whole movie is in the world of Frank Zito. What yeah. could almost be the a one man show. The maniac yeah. guy. The, the truth is, it was a blessing when really? Jason Miller dropped out. It was a blessing because then we developed, as you say, that the movie is from the point of view of the killer. When you I, never even see any and, cops and until I, the end of the movie. And I kind of yeah. thought about it as being the point of view of the shark in Jaws. I know you don't see, there's no <laughs> right. real connection. Shark they, vision. Yeah, yeah, but the idea was that it would be from the, 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 the perspective of the killer. For the most part of the movie, it's the perspective of the killer. Right. It was an economic restraint that enhanced the film artistically. Mm -hmm. And it was a great Without showcase a for Spinell. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, like, when you, all the stuff that he does in his private lair with yeah. all the dolls and everything, <laughs> well, okay. that is a, yeah. as fine a piece of acting as I think and you're ever going to see. And that's all his writing. Okay. Now, wow. I, I do want to I, I say, I mean, uh, the, okay, very creepy film, 1980. This film, I remember when this film came out. I remember the articles in Fangoria. And Bill, this was a controversial film at the time. This was not... at the center of the story I mean, of the whole slasher and, thing. And I was talking to, to the guys earlier. This is a time when, you know, we just got ourselves a new president. Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan came in. We There was this whole kind of uh, right cleanup living kind of a thing. Sure. Kind of a, you know, and here comes maniac. Yeah, moral majority. Moral, and all yeah, that stuff. and this is, and there's a lot of, 
horrible things in this film. And at the time, it was, for some people, it was as if our society itself was ending when this movie came yeah. out. Yeah. For, for us, like, it was like, wow, that's the coolest <laughs> thing yeah. ever. And, and, well, just, and just for listeners, I mean, the, the, the concept or the story, it's, it's, it's from the point of view of yeah, this a whole, serial a guy killer. guy who's going out stalking women. Yeah, yeah. who yeah. has kind of a Norman Bates-ish sort of issue with right. women and his, his mother. But, but it's yeah. weird. He, there are times when he seems, he can be charming. He can be, oh, no, oh, there's, he's, yes, he, there's yeah. like a regular guy, kind of a, kind of a regular right. guy thing about him. Well, that, was, yeah. that was Ted Bundy. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. I see that. And his, yes. his, you know, as I said, it was a compilation. The killing by the Verrazano Bridge was, of course, uh, David Berkowitz, Son of Sam. Right. That's yeah. exactly the location. And that, that was just a couple of years before. No, this Maniac. was during. No, Son of Sam Killing. It was before, yes. Yeah. It was before Maniac. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. But now, did you ever intend this to be so controversial? You were, how did you take all this controversy? Like, what? Well, firstly, the lightning rod for the controversy was the artwork. Oh, yes. That the was the lightning rod. Right. And that is what stirred up, I would say, the attention to the movie. Now, this was with, uh, like, you don't see the, you just see the guy holding, like, a yeah. scalp. Of yeah. The yeah. Hair. And also, it does, and also, he has an erection, if you look closely. <laughs> oh. Right. In the jeans. Wow. That's right. Hey. Never even noticed that before. <laughs> right. uh, hangs to the right. Wow. <laughs> weren't there, like, women's groups, like, painting over the yes. posters yeah. and stuff? And- Especially in Los Angeles. Less in New York, mostly in Philadelphia, uh, Los Angeles, a couple of other spots, but it really set off a, a firestorm. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was that the movie's marketing was right in your face. It mm-hmm. was right, what right. it was. It was unapologetic. Sure. The TV spots were pretty brutal. Kind of like Fulci's zombie, which was, we are going to eat you. That <laughs> yeah. was like in well, your face too. <laughs> yes, but it's in a fantasy way. Yeah. That's true. That's yeah, true. This, this, this was, right. you know, uh, this was... Uh, ripped off the front real. page. Yeah, this yeah. was ripped right. from the front yeah. page. Right. And we did have what I called the golden age of serial killers in the in the 70s. <laughs> That's true. That's true, yeah. And this came on the tail of those. Yeah. And so there was just a lot of reasons. And there was a lot of, how could I put? There was a lot of backlash towards the intensity of the depiction of violence yeah, in right. these in these horror films. So along comes Maniac, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we had a lot of problems. We, uh, but you know, at the same time, I got to tell you, there was times where I got some really weird mail that I wish I had saved. I never really say I never mm-hmm. saved it, but I got weird mail and stuff from people that I had made this movie and. And how can I say, I, I, I guess there was a part of me that kind of liked the fact I look, firstly, I made a movie. It was very successful. Yeah. It was very profitable. Mm-hmm. All my investors got paid plus. Yeah. plus right, um, right. And the controversy must have helped, right? Yeah. No, no, not necessarily. No, no. no Ooh, because okay. here's how it, here's how the backlash of the controversy hurt us. It was that the theaters make all their money on a new release the first and second week. Everybody knows this. Where the distributor starts to profit from the release is when the theaters keep the movie in for more than one or two weeks. Mm -hmm. That's when it starts to shift where the distributor starts to make money because their advertising costs are negligible at that point. What happened is the theaters, I don't know how sincere they were. We think they were being opportunists. But because it was an independent distributor without the clout of a studio, they took the position that, look, we can't have this controversy here anymore. We're going to take the movie out because, and and their position is, yeah, it's your movie, but we got to live here. And we got to live with these people that are protesting. Uh (laughs) Right. Now, I could see their point of view, but I could also see what they did was they took the cream of the revenue. Mm-hmm. Right, right. They took the cream and fucked the distributor. Oh. And that's really what happened. Right. So at the end of the day, it might have been for the distributor, by the way, not for us, but for the distributor, net, net, not as profitable as they had hoped. And keep in mind, when Maniac came out, there wasn't video. Yeah. Right. The right. video right. came out just, just after. 80, like right. just afterwards. Kind of, yeah. So you didn't have the enormous monies that video began generating five or six years later. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, there was mm-hmm. also not a pay TV possibility for a film like Mania. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. They were totally relying on theatrical. Yeah. Yes, right. They were totally relying on theatrical. There was no television mm-hmm. back end. Right. So for the distributor, 
it didn't work out as well as they had hoped. Right. Mm-hmm. But it was like, like I said, it was a seminal film at the time. And yeah. even though it's not everyone's cup of tea, it is no. extremely well, effective. And, and, well, and, it yeah. certainly planted a flag. Oh, yeah. It definitely and, and, did. And how I was introduced to the film was through Tom Savini, through the Grand Illusions book. And seeing this movie that was like, this is one of the films that Tom Savini did. And like, oh my God, what is this? Yeah. And you see these amazing effects that yeah. are nothing like I had ever seen. No, and at that, t- that point. At, at that time, Matt, there was, I mean, that's, it was really graphic stuff. Yeah. I mean, isn't it, is this the first time we see a head kind of exp- I had it, never it, seen it, anything no, like that. I mean, actually, um, no, it was done in scanners, which yeah. is right well, before right here. And we, yeah, yeah. and we did it I, exactly how they did scanners, right? We just yeah, shot, just but shot I mean, like, yeah, head, right? yeah. And, but, but like all the the scalping and all that stuff. Yeah. I'd, I'd never seen anything like that that was so visceral. Well, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't pull any punches, and it's a it's a spiral downward into this man's insane yeah. world and his insane vision. You and, know? and working with Savini, like, yeah. How, well, did, how did that whole thing come? That's about? The, well, I had seen <laughs> Dawn of the Dead. Mm-hmm. And was blown away Classic. by, by yep. oh, Tom's yeah. tour de force mm-hmm. effects, and uh, so I knew that I wanted that level of special effects in our film. But of course, as I say, we had no money. Mm-hmm. It just so happened somehow I, I made contact with somebody who knew Tom and got a message to him, and we heard from Tom, who was shooting in New Jersey Friday the Thirteenth. So Joe, myself, and Andy got in a car. We went down there, made a, an appointment to meet. Tom, and we told him, look, we're doing this movie in New York. Uh, We want you to do the effects in the movie, and we want you to come on board. And Tom, to our fortunate for us and fortunate for him, he had just broken up with a girl in Pittsburgh (laughs) and and did not want to go back to Pittsburgh. Uh (laughs) And Friday the 13th was, was coming to an end. So the deal was, if we got him an apartment to stay at in New York... He would come from uh, New Jersey to New York and do our movie. Wow. Oh, that's great. Relationships have a lot to do with <laughs> your movies. <laughs> Broken relationships. So our, including Tom's fees and materials, our entire Maniac special effects came to $5,000. No wow. way. You can't, you can't do a paper cut in a movie like that. Wow, yeah, I mean, that's today. amazing. That's amazing. That's his creativity, Everything. making all this stuff work. Wow, Everything. Did, no, I want to ask. He did, was working did, out of his apartment. That was his, uh, that was his, apart, his apartment was his studio. Okay. Oh um, so, and it was in my apartment building. I got it. I got it. <laughs> Bill, did, I'm always curious though. I mean, did he say, oh, and by the way, I'd like to be in it. Cause it always seems like in yes. every, cause it seems like if Tom is in a movie, it's like, oh, I know there's gonna be some, he's well, gonna get killed grizzly like, somehow, uh, you know? I, and, and, here's, I like him as an actor yeah yeah, yeah. well here's the thing yes he wanted to be in the movie <laughs> um, but it really was again an opportunity because tom had a bust of himself <gasps> and oh there you go he had a bust of himself like you said <laughs> and, and the thing is he was going to after the movie get a nose job so that bust would no longer be usable <gasps> so <laughs> he was getting his nose fixed in okay. some way after right. the movie. If you sure. look at him, his nose in the movie and yes, look at him after well, his right, okay. nose right. is a little bit less pronounced. <laughs> right. And uh, so, yeah, so we so used... He cast uh, that... He, he already had it. He already had it done. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. like, hey, you know, so we could do something really cool. Did did he make the suggestion at all? And so so I got this thing and we could just blow it up or... Oh, was yeah. It, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. would get more acting roles, I think, myself, if I had a if bus, you had a bus ready, yourself. filled with yeah. meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was... Uh, but it's a very graphic scene, and oh, it totally, I mean... But you know, it's Tom who fires the shotgun at his own head. <laughs> right, because he doubled no, first. Yeah. No, I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. I did awesome. not know Joe. that. Interesting. He doubled Joe, and he, he did the shotgun to the head. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was just one of these things, like, he had just come from Friday the 13th, and one of the things in the movie was, uh, the, I think it was the decapitation yeah. of, right, of, of uh, uh, Betsy uh, Palmer. Warrior, yeah, Mrs. Yeah. Voorhees, right. And so he had the stump. So we threw it in at the end of the movie. Yeah. Why? We just had it. He had it. In his, yeah, that was. He had it there. It's kind apartment. of a weird, creepy thing. At yeah, the, we yeah. just we just sort of stuck it in there yeah. with having this thing going <laughs> yeah, on. Right, a little right. blood squirt. Yeah, yeah, a little remember. blood yeah. squirt. Yeah, and that that was from Friday Thirteenth. And uh, I don't know how many people. Uh, well, I'll tell you something. The statute of limitations has expired. I'm sure. <laughs> oh, here, we oh, here we go. We love hearing yeah. that. The uh, sound effect of the shotgun. We were mixing the movie at a facility that had mixed Dawn of the Dead, and our sound editor, 
I had put in a sound effect for the shotgun blast. Mm -hmm. And I said, that doesn't work for me. The best shotgun blast I ever heard was in Dawn of the Dead when the guy kicks open the door, mm -hmm. fires the, the blast mm -hmm. of the shotgun, yeah. and you see the person's head explode or yeah. something. It's my like ringtone. <laughs> <laughs> so what we did is we were in the middle of the night. We went into the the storage facility, the uh, you know the in the back room. Whoa. We pulled out real one of Dawn of the Dead. <laughs> wow! We, we put it up, and I stole their shotgun. <laughs> wow! <laughs> only you heard it here. You heard only on here on parties. Monster oh, that's Party. George Romero watching so the, Maniac. Wait a minute! <laughs> so that shotgun blast is the one from Dawn of the Dead. That's the great. Sound. That's, that's awesome. so great. That's great <laughs> okay, so now, I, okay, so Maniac was successful you hit it out of the park okay so at that time was this like your calling card and go hey now i can move on to bigger and better things I can scalp people all over the no, place no 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 yeah, not yeah. scalping people i mean yeah. first of all I, i'm sure there was a little baggage from well this is the guy who did maniac but well actually funny enough i had offers to make movies mm -hmm. i had an offer from william morris to represent me there was a project at warner that they wanted me to direct and all this <sighs> But I really loved being an independent. I mm -hmm. loved being able to not have anybody to answer to. Mm -hmm. And as crazy as it is, I probably, in you know, I might have had a different career had I taken the road, like a lot of my other colleagues did, mm -hmm. of working in mainstream Hollywood. But I decided I want to stick it out myself and make movies and produce and direct because I just loved it. It was a high. It was mm -hmm. a high to go to Cannes and sell your movie that oh, you made yeah. for yeah. one hundred and thirty-five thousand and walk out with a million dollars in contracts. It mm -hmm. was just, you wow. know, it's such a it's such a feeling of accomplishment. And so that's why when I did my next film, I just decided I'm going to do it myself again. Mm -hmm. We'll do it the same thing we did before. And we did the movie Vigilante. Mm -hmm. Right. Vigilante. Robert Forster. Right. Yeah. I, the one thing about your movies, too, is you have, you assemble the best cast of like character actors. I mean, you just have great people in your movies. You really do. Well, you know, I love actors. And I've always loved particularly character actors. I was always drawn to them. Yeah, so I, I do think about that. I mean, Vigilante had, I mean, you had Robert Forrester, Fred Williamson, Joe Spinell, mm -hmm. Carol Lindley, Woody Strode. Yeah, uh, yeah. I actually wow. put in the script for the character Woody Strode. <laughs> <laughs> so it was in the script. That's great. And, wow. and it was kind of like, in a way, your Death Wish, your version mm -hmm. of Death Wish a little bit. I mean, yes, it was. It was, of course, it was an urban retribution film, and, right. and Death Wish is the granddaddy of all urban retribution films. But it was by way of wanting it to stylistically be something like a spaghetti western mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it was yes it was thematically the same it was in the same genre but from a creative standpoint stylistically we wanted it to be like a spaghetti western but like in an urban set uh, an urban spaghetti mm -hmm. western wow that's awesome yeah and that's that was my thinking on it that was your next film right after maniac was yes. that successful too it was but it was not as immediately financially successful for us mm -hmm. because our distributor in the U.S. went bankrupt. Uh -huh. And if, so that's a story in of itself. I don't even want to get into it. No. But it, we, they went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And we also had a problem in that when Reagan took office, uh, there was a shift <laughs> in the dollar exchange overseas. Oh. And so what happened is we had all these contracts for the film yeah. that was suddenly worth about a third less <gasps> no. than, wow. uh, than we had when we had signed the contracts because they were tied to the exchange rate oh my God. at the time Jeez. of the signing. So in the short term, it was a, a difficult movie. It took us truly about 10 years to break even. Did home video help Jeez. that? Yeah, by that point, video was... Well, here's what happened is, is the distributor that went bankrupt sold it to home video without having the rights to sell oh, to home no. video. Oh, what? And it was at the time we found out about the home video deal that this distributor went in parts unknown. Uh-huh. God, I see. Yeah, yeah. Man. It was terrible. And oh. we sued Vestron. It was just... Oh, wow. It was oh, ugly. Okay. Right, I right. spent a lot of time on wooden benches in courtrooms oh, trying wow. to reclaim my movie. But wow. you, you kept moving forward. You kept moving forward. 
I did, but I got to tell you, it did put a, a little wind out of my sails. Yeah. And right. so there was a gap. Yeah, yeah. a little bit more between, time passed before yeah, the next between one. Between yeah. Vigilante and Maniac Cop. Yes. Right. There was a gap. I think I went through a bit of a, you know, I was in my 20s. Mm-hmm. I went through, mm-hmm. well, you know, I'm not infallible. I'm mm-hmm. not as, I'm, I may not be the genius I might think I was or people were telling me I was and all this. Starting you know. to second thought those yeah, decisions was, about, oh, Warner Brothers yeah, and I was uh, starting William to, Morris. Maybe I should have. Uh, oh, yeah. God, second. <laughs> Don't get me started. I could have I I had a T-shirt of second thoughts. <laughs> but and I was just going through a weird period of just, uh, you know, I really hadn't had a, an adolescence. I was always working. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so I'm there I am in my 20s. I'm feeling a little vulnerable. I'm, and uh, so it was a weird situation. I mean, fortunately, it's funny, vigilante, much to my delight, has continued to resonate with audiences. Really? I, I, mm-hmm. I, and I, and yeah, it does. It's It, it kind of surprises me. It's not, as of course, a, as big as Maniac is yeah. today. Yeah. But Vigilante constantly gets played. I'm, I'm doing an appearance, as an example, at Alamo Draft House in Yonkers, New York, where they're screening Vigilante. But Alamo Draft House has screened it multiple times at mm-hmm. different... Uh, different right. it's, a, it's, uh, what's a nice, it's a good no-nonsense, lean and mean yeah. exploitation. And, and there, there are people that enjoy those films and they don't make them anymore. Yeah, yeah. they don't. That's, no. and, that, well, you're right. And, yeah. and, and so it's a film which really captures that genre at that time. Right. And, and uh, Robert Forster is and, one of those yes. really kind of sympathetic but underutilized character actors. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. He's, and it's and one of my favorite genres, too, the revenge I will, flick. I yeah. will tell you that Robert Forster wasn't the original actor I cast. The original actor I cast was uh, Tony Musanti. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And and from Birth of the Crystal Plumage. From Birth of the Crystal mm-hmm. Plumage. Yeah. And for the role that Fred played, I had Leon Isaac Kennedy. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, for different reasons, uh, Tony Musanti's case, we had already started to... We started pre-production, and we were meeting with him and stuff, but um, without going into too many details, nothing. there was nothing really salacious or anything, but he just appeared to us to be a little wacky, a little mm-hmm. unstable. Really? Yeah. Just oh, okay. a little. Mm-hmm. You know, we felt as though this could be a problem. Right, mm-hmm. right. And then we started to hear his reputation and why he wasn't maybe working as much as he could. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, uh, and, it was, and we decided to pull our offer from Tony Musanti, and we were scrambled, and it turned out my friend, uh, Frank Pesh, uh, he met, he was in a movie called 29th Street. It's actually about him. I don't know if you guys ever saw it. Mm. Anyway, Frank Pesh, you'll see him pop up in Stallone's films and things like that. He's a pal of Stallone. He, I called up, I, he called me up just asking what's going on with Vigilante, looking for his role in the movie, of course. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, we just had it separated with uh, Tony Mazzanti. Anyway, it turns out he knew Bob Forster, or he knew somebody who knew oh, Bob wow. Forster. I said, he would be great. So, he, so that was the first time he worked with Forster? Oh, yeah. Cause, cause first time I, we, first yeah. time I met him was on, wow. really, literally, yeah. a couple of days before we started shooting. Just mm-hmm. a sturdy, reliable and, actor. Yeah. And as a friend, we are still friends to this day. That's awesome. We are wow. still... We That's still great. see each other on a regular basis. We have dinner maybe once every... Have him come over here. We'll, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. no. yeah. well, well, I'm dinner. We, 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 we're really close friends. I yeah. consider awesome. him a dear close friend. Well, but he, he was in it, and I think with Leon, it was a financial thing. Yeah. And we brought in uh, Fred Williamson. And it really turned out to be... Um, yeah, great Again, cast. again yes. you know, serendipity yeah. you know, rules. Totally. We, and as you said, that is a constant in all these films, uh, the, the great cast you guys get. Yeah. yeah. True. yeah. Speaking of great cast, yes. uh, yes. we're going to jump to 1988. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, and his now, re- relationship with Larry Cohen yeah, like, and I, uh, because, this uh, whole uh, Maniac, Maniac Cop. Cop, which is such a, a perfect horror action hybrid. And this is a really fun movie. Probably a more mainstream movie, I guess, in a way. Really and, interesting concept. Yeah. yeah. And and this is written by another great idol of ours, Larry Cohen. Mm-hmm. How how did you guys meet and how did this come about? Well, Larry and I met through the president of a lab that in New York that let both Larry and I used. <laughs> and the president of the lab one day he said to me, he said, You know, you and Larry, you two are like <laughs> two peas in the same pod. You guys ought to meet. You guys ought to meet and, and maybe do something together. You know, right. that's how the guy talked at the time. Right. It was New York. And um, so I was coming out to California to, for the opening of Vigilante. Mm-hmm. And I met Larry. We had breakfast. We went. I showed him Vigilante, came to a, the theater to see the movie. And then, you know, that was it. You know, we had met and it was nice. Okay. Very, very nice. 
nothing, no sparks flew, but it was just really, sure, right. you know, really a good meeting. Okay. Cut to four years later, roughly, he had just gotten fired from a movie that he was shooting in New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was some movie with Billy D. Williams playing a detective. and uh, it's, it's, I, oh. I forget the name of it. But Larry was fired from the movie. And what Larry does when he gets fired from movies is he starts his own movie. Like, for instance, <laughs> when he got fired, he was the original director of I, the Jury, you know, the one with Asante. Asante. He wrote it. Movie. He wrote it. He wrote the movie and uh, he started directing the movie and then was fired. And when he got fired, he went back to his hotel room and wrote Q the Wing Serpent. Oh <gasps> no. Well, I'm glad and, he got fired. And, oh my God. I love you. Called yeah, up me too. Arkoff, who, who he had done many films for back in the AIP days. And Arkoff agreed to put up some money. And uh, he went off and made uh, wow. Q the Winged Serpent. Wow. So what happened was Larry got fired from this movie and he decided he wanted to make the movie that became The Ambulance. Oh, it just yeah. didn't happen exactly the same way as Q, mm-hmm. but it happened many years after that, but he wanted to make The Ambulance. Mm-hmm. So when he was in New York, he was casting The Ambulance and one of the people that came in was my Uncle Jake. Oh, and, Jake LaMotta, okay. Yeah, Jake LaMotta. And somehow the subject came to me. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I know your nephew and, yeah. you know, and all this kind of stuff. And and uh, so after that meeting, Larry calls me up. He goes, hey, how you doing? He goes, you want to have lunch? I said, sure. So I remember it was February. It was a snowy day, New York City. We go to a, a restaurant in Lincoln Center and we start talking. And Larry says, you know, why didn't you ever do a sequel or something to Maniac? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And I said, well, I always felt the movie kind of had a period on it. You know, there was no <laughs> right. way yeah. to go further with the film. He goes, and at the time, you remember there was RoboCop. Yes. Beverly yeah. Hills yeah. Cop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Right. And Larry says, what about Maniac Cop? <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yes, it is. And then during the, sa- during the lunch, we began brainstorming because we said, God, with that title, maybe we, you know, we get a piece of artwork. We could take it around and try to raise money. Uh-huh. So we came up with the copy line during the lunch of "You have the right to remain silent." Dot 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 forever. So, oh. so with the tagline and the title, I then decided uh, we had a movie. Now, as I said, it was February. We felt as though. For a script that had not been written, we said at some point we're going to want to have the St. Patrick's Day parade. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because nothing relates better to cops than the St. Patrick's Absolutely. Day. Absolutely. New York, right. well, You know, he used it in God Told Me To. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, another favorite. Movie. It's, it, you know, it's used it's in a, The Fugitive. I mean, it's a, it's a great yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah, the whole well, Day you know, in Larry's case, if it if worked once, recycle it and use it again. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we decided in some place we're going to have the St. Same, the same Patrick's Day parade in this in, movie in this called movie Maniac, Maniac Cop, right. Cop, where we have no script. <laughs> So <laughs> the parade was written. <laughs> so yeah. all those extras um, you hired. Wow. Well, <laughs> so what happened is at the same time I was hanging out with Sam uh Raimi in New York because oh, he, wow. he was waiting for the That's financing right, yeah. to come in on Dark Man. Really? Oh, okay. He, so one of my heroes. He was staying with at the time I think some girl in, in uh, the west side, not far from where I lived. And uh he was, you know, biting at the bit waiting for a dark man to come yeah. together. And Evil Dead Two had just opened. Yep. And I went to see Evil Dead Two and I thought Bruce Campbell was amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought he's he was, great. He was even better than in the first picture. Absolutely. Yeah, well, yes. Oh, yes. oh yeah, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. It yeah. was just yeah. again was, another one man show almost. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I get Bruce's number from Sam. I give I give Bruce a call. I said, um, I think he was living actually not far from here. I, I go, um, Bruce, um, I'm making a movie called Maniac Cop. <laughs> I want you to star in it, but I don't have a script, so don't ask me for one. <laughs> All I know is I want you to come to New York and I want you to bring clothes that we could later duplicate. Okay. Oh, okay. So I got he agreed. <gasps> I got Bruce a ticket to fly to New York. Uh-huh. I got Sam. I pulled together a small crew, rented some equipment for a day, uh-huh. and we went out and shot all that St. Patrick's Day footage. So all those characters. And, you are oh, kidding. And then, and then Larry faxed me the page 
that Sam Raimi read as the news reporter referring to characters that had yet to be written. <laughs> oh, wow. Which, which, I, which, I, which I loved his little cameo. Yeah, Sam Raimi really has good. a cameo yeah, as a news good. reporter at the parade and yeah. it blew me away and when I, love, I saw and he, that. And he threw it, of course, the line, what a parade it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we literally all crammed into a van. We drove up to where the parade was passing. You remember, this is pre-9-11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah we yeah. pull up at the van to where the parade is passing Sam gets out. He's wearing this this winter coat. Yeah, we give him a mic and we, you know, and give him the page from Larry. He memorizes it and he starts referring to these again. Nothing had been written. There yeah, wasn't a, there wow. wasn't any. Wow, wow. Bell, I have to ask you this. There, there's a shot during the yeah. parade. Yes, of the cop. Of a cop drinking. It's absolutely uh, amazing. It, it was not. It was documentary footage. Crazy. So we he's went like out. drinking some booze. Yeah. Or yes, no, yeah. a beer. A beer. He's drinking a beer. And, his and it looks like somebody snaps yes. him. Yeah. 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 It's oh like, my hey, gosh. We, we caught it. Oh, that's <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. 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 If you, if listeners, if you watch Maniac Cop, you'll you'll know what we're talking about. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, and, and this because this really gave you some production value too in the movie, right? Like, oh, the the um, the establishing shot we did from the window of my uh, sales agent, <laughs> who had an office there, awesome. which overlooked uh, Fifth Avenue. So oh, we man, went up. Right. I took a camera up there. I did the the tilt down to the parade. Yeah, all awesome. that all that stuff. We were running. It, it was really. I look back. It was fun. It was really fun. And then I remember all of us after being exhausted. Oh, and Sam went out. We shot so much footage. I wish I could find where that footage is. I mean, I had. Like raw. I wouldn't call it deleted scenes, but I would call it just a lot of excess footage. <laughs> they did think was Sam. He dressed in different clothes to play a bum. And no, <laughs> really. Bruce runs around the corner and he hits, and Sam yeah. falls over. Oh and, my god! And it was just all this crazy stuff that we shot. That we had no idea what we were doing, how it was going to come. I mean, we only used a minuscule amount. Yeah, of but what it's we, effective. But, 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 but Bill, this is this is like I mean, guerrilla filmmaking in a way oh, sure. in New York. I mean, no permits. No, oh. I mean, I mean <laughs> permits. We had nothing. No, we, it's like no. Come on, Sean, no, here know, in L.A. You yeah. know, you, well, you nowadays, can't do anything yeah, without nowadays. a permit. No, you know, and here now, he is yeah. out. You know, doing all this dangerous stuff, no, parking his nothing. van. We had no insurance. We had no. Oh my God, no insurance. They probably thought if anyone saw you, they probably thought you actually were oh, a yes. local oh, news. Exactly. Right. Yeah. No, no, I, actually our cover was that we're student film. Oh, oh, the student uh-huh. film. Because we were so small. I mean, we right, had right. 35 millimeter. I have to yeah. say, we had a 35 millimeter camera with us, right. but we were such a small crew. We're running around in a van. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't exactly we walk. We're out there with Chapman cranes. Right. You know? right, right. <laughs> so, so you know, and and we. I don't even recall we were ever even asked. At, All right. Right, yeah. right. So you right. so you shoot that you shoot, shoot the it. stuff. Okay? Yeah. I the remember we wound needs up. To be, I remember know. we wound up at a bar. Uh-huh. I remember it's St. Patrick's Day. We're at a, We're at this. Bar on on the west side, and if you guys know anything about organized crime, the Westies, um, <laughs> this Matt, was Matt's specialty. This I'll, was the, I'll take it from here. The, the, this <laughs> was this was a bar that at the time the IRA guys, when they got too hot to be in Ireland, yeah. the Westies would put them to work in New York at this bar. No, this wow. is before the I, you know, before the I, you know, the immigration sure. and all sure, this kind sure. of shit. Right, right. But these guys would come over and they would come to work. So this bar was all the bartenders, the waiters, everybody. Were we're all X I R A guys wow. who are working there, and we're there. We're having, and they're great guys, by yeah. the way. Great guys, oh, I'm, I'm sure. Really, sure. You know, yeah. They, yeah. I, I could only understand like a, a quarter of what they would say, but they were great guys. <laughs> I'm not going to ask questions as long as the drink's fine. Yeah. 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 And um, so we wound up at this bar on 57th Street near the 9th Avenue, and we just had a great time. We all got drunk. We went home afterwards. It was just great. Wow. We got it done. We got it done. So now I have this footage, Maniac Cop. Yeah. I had no I had no money. I had no money. I had no no money to produce it. Larry started writing the script unbeknownst to me. He wrote the script. And he wrote it and by April I had a full script. Now Larry didn't get paid. He wasn't mm-hmm. paid. He yeah. just on speculation, yeah. wow. wrote the script. If you just give uh, just for our listeners. Just give us a very brief gist of the concept of the movie, which is Maniac great. Cop. Well, it, it was Maniac Cop. Was the idea of Maniac Cop was a cop uh, who, in his time, was not unlike those. Uh, he was a tough cop. I don't know if you guys are are you guys film noir fans? Oh sure. yeah, oh yeah. Yes. yes. Do you ever see like a film like uh, Where the Sidewalk Ends? 
Okay. Did you ever see that? I don't know that specific um, one. Okay. Or did you ever see On Dangerous Ground? Nicholas yes. Rose. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. You remember, like, for instance, Robert Ryan, the beginning of the film, he's like punching a criminal. He's going, right. Why are you making me <laughs> yeah. do this yeah. to you? Yes. You know? Yeah. Do all kind of right. stuff. The idea was that Matt Cordell was a cop who was well intended, but took to brutal means. Right. Mm-hmm. To, went a little uh, too to, far. Yeah. He went too far. And he also was a guy who uncovered corruption. We don't really know exactly what it was, right. but it was corruption that reached the heights of the uh, New York City sure. uh, political world. Right, right. So he was framed for what? I don't know. Thrown in jail yeah. with the very criminals he put behind bars. Right, yeah. right. While in jail, he is attacked by those criminals. In the shower. In the shower, yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, this way we could see his muscles yeah. and, and everything. Big guy. And big big, big guy. guy. Yeah. yeah, big strong guy. And uh, he's attacked, uh, left for dead. And now, mysteriously, there is there is a cop on the street, circa of, of his period. And now he is a anarchist. He is doing things. He's not going after criminals, but after the very people that he protected. Right, right. He's now, he's gone kind of a little bit off the deep end. And kind of rogue. Right. And, so yeah. somebody like, you know, runs a red light, they kill, right. he kills him. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, he feels a guy who's totally fucked over and he's going to come back and, and do this. Now, I was always unsure. I think I was more sure he was a zombie than he was a guy who was just uh, right. Yeah. Because there's a dead. thing that like he has yeah. brain damage. Well, that's or that's kind of how I read it yeah. into it. You know? right, yeah. Right. We honestly, I, I, while I'm making the movie, I'm trying to decide. <laughs> <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't really come to a a decision on it. Okay. I really didn't want to come to a decision on it. It was one of those things where I was kind of going back and forth. When I did the second one, I was I confirmed he was a zombie. Yeah, he's more of a yeah. monster. He's right. a monster well, in the he's, second He's one. indestructible, so he pretty right. much has to be walking right. dead. I know. Yes, but you know, you could say, you know, this, I, anyway. Tough guy. We're, we're going to save we're, that zombie <laughs> argument for another show. Yeah. Yeah. I've written some fan no, fiction. No, 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 clear no, this no, up. no, no. Bill, let's get to it. So, so anyway, that's the, the basic idea. So what I loved about the script was it really, for me, Yes, it was a. It had horror elements. Yeah. But I also love that it was also a classic film noir mm-hmm. in its yeah. story. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I love the idea. I kept thinking of this guy as being like uh, Dana Andrews and and where the sidewalk ends yeah. or Robert Ryan. You know, I thought about that's how he. I wanted a guy who looked like kind of had the build of like a uh, you know of like a Robert Mitchum or something. Yeah. I kept yeah. thinking right, like right. Oh, yeah. this would be the kind of guy who was really old fashioned. You know. And his, just looks unstoppable. Yeah. yeah. And, right, and, right. Yeah. So, okay. So that was, that was that. But then the story of how Bruce Campbell gets involved, again, classic film noir. You have a cop who is having an affair, yeah. but he has a wife who's unstable and thinks that potentially he could be the maniac cop by the description. Right. Yeah. Follows him, discovers his adultery. And runs and becomes then the victim of the maniac cop. Right. Yeah. And all fingers point to Bruce Campbell, Bruce Campbell as character, yeah. being, of course, killing his wife after she finds him, uh, another find, woman. finds out with him with another woman. And so I just love that. I said, that's really cool. I yeah. really love this. This is something where an actor, I mean, this is really good stuff for Bruce to sink his teeth into. Yeah. Right. right. It's a really good thing. And he's, and he's actually and then, terrific. I, I love yeah, him. Yeah. 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 And then add to that the wonderful Sherry North right. in the right. tragic character yes. of the ex girlfriend of the monster. And somehow enabling him, yeah, to yeah. Get, like the records yeah. department. Right. Oh my yeah. god! So she has the, the, the leg. So and, oh my god! These it's were like a... such wonderful characters, all out of the imagination of Larry Cohen, mm-hmm. and I just love the script. And I'm going, this is going to be a great. I knew the movie was great. It's funny, it, you know. Sometimes making a movie feels like what you're doing is facilitating the inevitable Mm -hmm. right and this was one of those movies i said it's for me to fuck up okay yeah you know that i got a good script i got i I got a really good cast you got a terrific cast tom atkins tom atkins Atkins. Atkins. i mean right across the board when i I, I first came to la i stayed there were two places i stayed the sheridan universal and uh the sportsman's lodge oh sportsman's lodge yeah (laughs) don't brag yeah (laughs) tom atkins 
uh, was a regular at the bar at the Sportsman's Lodge. <laughs> wow. And there he was, the fog, escaped wow. from New York. Wow. I'm like, you yeah. know, I'm like fanboy number one. And, <laughs> and, and uh, so when I did this movie, I can't, I wasn't friends with Tom. We were, we met, we were bar, have a drink together, you know, things like that. Talk about John Carpenter, but nothing, <laughs> nothing more than, and then I, I, I said, I got to have him to play that character yeah. I wanted yeah. to play the character and we just put together a really a, 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 I thought we had like a really wonderful cast you yeah. did yeah, yeah. Richard Roundtree Roundtree is Smith. great right. uh, mm-hmm. one of my favorite moments Bill movie. Smith I'm a big fan of he's great he's in several of your movies yeah, yeah. but uh, one of my favorite Tom Atkins moments is when Richard Roundtree's like he goes to him you don't smile much, do you? Yeah, like, that's, like, a, like, that's an amazing does scene. This forced yeah. awkward little yeah. smile. It's great. No, he's so good. No. And and Bruce Campbell, previous to that, it was the Evil Dead movies, yeah. where there's a sort of a comedic yeah. slant to it. Whereas in that movie, he really is playing this kind of hard boiled yeah. character yeah. and just run. does yeah. it on the run. Perfect. And think, Bill, the thing that gets me about this film, which really, really surprised me, this is this is considered like a low budget film, but you put there's so much in this film. So much I mean, action. when it well, when it builds and there's oh, creepiness, stunts. and also, I mean, there's a stunt at the towards the end, and Bill, I'm watching this, and I don't know if you had permits to do this thing, but there's <laughs> a vehicle. Not to give too much away, but there's a vehicle that kind of goes off somewhere. And there's a person on the side of the vehicle, and he tries to push off on the other side. And I watch it go, oh, my God, this guy could have been killed. It looked incredibly (laughs) dangerous. It was. Yeah, okay. It yeah. was. Uh, it was incredibly dangerous. Yes, we had permits. Yes, oh. we had insurance. Okay. Oh, we were, okay. We were, we were, okay. We, this was not at that level. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. All right. Who we were, was your stunt guy? Because you use him okay, a lot. Okay, well, right? here's the thing. The guy who actually performed the stunt was our stunt coordinator, Spiro Rosados. Mm-hmm. Now, Spiro has gone on to be Hollywood's number one stunt coordinator, second direct, second unit. I did he not does know. all the Fast and Furious movies. Oh, oh, I okay. did he know. does the Expendables. Yeah. He does, uh, wow. you look up his credits, yeah. it's uh, Captain America, the two Captain America films. Wow. He's, wow. Awesome. He, 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 the guy is- it's Big time now. He is as big time as you're ever going to get. Okay. Maniac Cop was like his second job. Wow. The first being just the car flip in a movie. Yeah, yeah. But as far as a stunt coordinator, second unit, doing yeah. all that kind of stuff, Maniac Cop was his first full-fledged job. The only thing he had to show me when he got the job was he had a home movie of him. He was a young guy. Yeah. He had a home movie of him running on the roof of his mother's house <laughs> to the theme from Shaft <laughs> and jumping off the end of the roof. Really? <laughs> and you're hired. Yeah. And that's just a, today, that's just another day on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I saw that and I said, you know, this guy really is passionate about st- st- stunts and, yeah. And, yeah. and doing this. And he was such, and, and still is, the nicest nicest guy you'll ever meet in your life and i love him dearly and we did so many movies together Mm -hmm. but one of the things we did after maniac cop is we began uh frequenting the uh theaters down in chinatown Mm -hmm. and we were watching this is again the mid uh we're talking the mid late 80s we were watching the the early john woo films Mm -hmm. like the better tomorrow films Mm -hmm. the Choey hark films Mm -hmm. the uh the jackie chan films And we were studying these movies, he and I. We would go down there, just us. In the, It was called the Quo Wa Theater in, in uh, Monterey Park or something. And it's no longer there, but it was all decrepit. It was, you know, and, uh, and, and, and we were just the only white people in the audience. <laughs> and, and we're watching, you know, non-Asians, I should say. And we were studying these movies, and mm-hmm. we were watching the stunts, all of which we brought to Maniac Cop Two. I was going to say you yeah. really upped the ante. You did, right. in, in, but that in Maniac that Cop was 2. because of all this knowledge we were we were getting by watching these Hong Kong movies. Anyway, to talk about that end stunt specifically, yeah. it was an enormously dangerous stunt. Yeah, it one looks that, it. One which Spiro would never uh, do again. Uh-huh. It was so dangerous, mm-hmm. and I didn't realize all of the things that could have gone wrong. Mm-hmm. Was it just the one take you guys did? Of course, of course yeah. right? Yeah. Well, Sean, no God, with that well, vehicle? Uh, Come on, are you an idiot? <laughs> 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 like, it's, it's like it is a one-time thing. You yeah, had yeah, multiple yeah. cameras on it, though. Of course. I mean, and he it, is the stunt man. He is doing yes. that, yes. Yeah, and yeah. the way he launches himself oh, away I, from that truck. How does he? Great. I'm 
watch it, and and when you watch, if you if folks, if you watch this film and you get to this point, you you almost have to go back and watch it again. Yes, because very it much looks so. as as the vehicle goes thrust in the air, and he goes off one way where the vehicle goes the other, and he's kind of spinning in mid air. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, the force of the vehicle. I mean, it almost looks like he's veering towards the other vehicle. He could have been crushed. I mean, I mean, it's frightening when you watch this. One yeah. of the most dangerous parts of it. Okay, I'll I'll reveal how it was done, but it's it's still dangerous. It's not like I'm telling you anything that's going to make it seem less dangerous. This vehicle had no engine in it. Mm. It had no engine. Okay. Okay, there was no motor in the vehicle. It was a shell of a truck. Okay. But it did steer. Yeah. And what happened is off camera there was a, another stuntman who power drove. Mhm. What's called power driving the truck to give it speed. Yeah. And then stops. So then we don't see that car. That right. car is off camera. So now you have the truck going at a speed sufficient to launch it. There's a pipe ramp mm-hmm. about this thick. From the outside of the car, while pretending to be fighting the cop, Spiro had to be driving the, <gasps> the truck so that <laughs> no. so that the driver's side front wheel yeah. hit that pipe ramp uh-huh. right where it had to hit it. If he missed it, the truck would land on the pipe ramp. Yeah. Or worse, if he if he went over to the side, the pipe ramp would rip him off the side of the, the truck because right, right, right. he couldn't do anything to stop it. Right. So he had to hit that wheel on that pipe ramp. And the pipe ramp had at the, at the end of it what's called the kicker. The kicker is what causes the vehicle to kind of fly, yeah. to look like it's flying mm-hmm. midair. Spiro had to get off the truck. He couldn't get off the truck right away. Or else he could kill himself. Mm-hmm. He had he had it worked out that at a certain point of the arc mm-hmm. is when he was able to come off the side. Yeah. Wow. So besides driving the vehicle, he had to be precise yeah. as as any kind of acrobat right, that right. he had to get off that vehicle at a certain point of that arc. Mm-hmm. Keep in mind that you're watching it in slow motion. Yeah. It's all happening fast. Yeah, right. Okay. And this is no CGI. Yeah. There's no, I mean, there's nothing. It didn't exist. nothing but no. I, just, I, yeah, I, instinct and physics. Timing, yeah. I later found out uh, Spiro was a deeply religious Greek Orthodox. He was deeply religious. And I found out later he had his priest come to his trailer before oh he did the, the thing. No. To, uh, oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, okay. Wow. Let, a dedication. In when this, it, yeah. But when this stunt happened, are you there and you're watching oh, it? Oh, we're and saying, and, and, I mean, no, no. I, I know. And, and you're going, oh, he nailed it? Or like, oh, uh, you're going too far? Or, no, I mean, no, no. We, we, we knew we had it. Oh, because it's, yeah. it, it's... We, we knew it. Yeah, we it's knew a thing of beauty. It. it is. It's, we, it, it was just a question of whether one of the cameras jammed yeah. or something. But that's All the right. special yeah. thing about Maniac Cop. It's more than people go, oh, it's such a slasher. You know, it's more than that. There's a lot of stuff that Bill put into this film, and it just, it, it by every scene, it really, just surprises you. It's yeah. really fun. It's, it moves really fast. Yeah. It's really and the fun. film works on all those levels. The, the, the film movie. must have been successful because you go on it to was. make another two. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, it was gonna, very successful. Maniac jump. Cop was a, was successful all over the world. It was really uh, Japan. It was a big hit. Wow. It was yeah. a big hit in France. Now I'm not sure it was a UK. fan of cops though because it kind of portrayed. I mean, it's. Kinda, did you did you get nobody, it? Nobody. Yeah, nobody yeah, yeah, okay. It wasn't more kind of. Well, my brother was a prosecutor. Okay, and he actually appears in the movie. He's, <gasps> he's the uh, he's the the morning sergeant talking to the people. Oh, oh when uh, when, okay. when uh, uh, Bill Smith comes in and pulls Bruce Campbell yeah, out. Yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah. That's my brother at the lecture. No lectern. way. Uh, he also appears at the end hanging from the ceiling. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. that, which is a creepy. There's a yeah, bunch right. of creepy stuff in that. Okay. Yeah, he hangs from the ceiling, dead as a swinging, swinging with yeah. little legs. I, I, I thought it was pretty even-handed when it came to cops. Well, like there were the good ones, there were the bad ones. Me, yeah, my brother. Put up the poster in his office, uh-huh. and of course, as a prosecutor, he has cops coming in and out. Yeah. They loved it. Uh, You're <laughs> kidding. I can see that. that. I can see well, that. The they love it. They're cops. Yeah, that's for it, right. Well, you know, yeah. you know I know, I know, but I, I was wondering, you know, after a maniac, he had done maniac, and now it's like controversial. I thought with right. with maniac cop, oh no. my god, no. So you did not get right. that. Oh, interesting. No, right. zero controversy. And then right. you know, when Sean was talking about some of the cast, we were talking about great cast. You have uh, Robert Zadar. Yes, play, and and he's this big hulking dude with a kind of a 
big chin, kind of a creepy face yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah, he was great, though. Yeah. Great, yeah. great so chin. He just died. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, so he, so he, he passed, he, passed away, away yeah. recently, but he was in all of these, wasn't he? He was. Yeah. Well, let's let's jump to 1990, Maniac Cop 2. Okay. That movie, talk about stunt sequences. Yes. Yeah. E- even more elaborate and more impressive With effects. With fire! And, and this was, <laughs> I, love the, I, I love the concept of this movie, too. Also written by Larry Cohen. Yes. Yeah. Which was, you bring in this crazy uh, serial killer, played by Leo Rossi. Yeah. And so this cool little teaming up of, of the crazy kind of bearded serial killer and towering Robert Zadar. Well, we kind of based that on Son of Frankenstein. Oh. <laughs> Leo yeah. Rossi right. was, was, was our Igor. Uh, I That's see. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, and uh, the thing I love too is also it's like the, the Maniac Cop ends, and now Maniac Cop it continues on. It's yeah. the story, and I right. love you. Still have you still have Bruce Campbell in it. You although, see. although I do have to ask this, uh, Maniac Cop closes like on St. Patrick's Day or in that period. Maniac Cop <laughs> Two is a day or two later, and it's Christmas time. <laughs> oh, yeah, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Leave it for James to be <laughs> Bill. Bill, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> there was a jump cut <laughs> that you didn't see. I didn't know if I missed something. <laughs> wow, yeah. you're a you're a That's, rough critic. Oh man. my gosh, that, I, is, that is tough. <laughs> and, um, but uh, I will figure your way in the minority. <laughs> <laughs> he he, yeah, us, he yeah. usually is. Yeah. 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 It's a That's great true. movie. And yeah. again, but, talk about not just returning uh, Lauren Landon Lorraine, and, yeah. and uh, Bruce Campbell, but you got Robert Davi, mm. Claudia Christian, mm-hmm. uh, Michael Lerner, Clarence Williams III. Right. Uh, Another great uh, cast. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. Oh, although yeah. I did, one of my issues, though, without giving too much away, because I do want listeners to see this, is there's some characters that it surprises me that they're not through the whole film, you know, <laughs> right, well, right. and and I and it kind of made me mad, Bill, when that happened. I'm, I I got pissed. Well, don't, don't I wouldn't, did. Wouldn't you be more pissed if you had characters who had gone through this adventure in the yeah. first movie, yeah, and you have to somehow manufacture another dilemma for them mm-hmm. in the second movie? Mm-hmm. That somehow starts to feel forced versus having fresh new characters uh, to follow in sure. a new. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. Because then it becomes just every sequel formula. No, no. no. I, 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 I like there's the a, fact that it was a, a different. It was a different plot, very different plot in the second one, which is which is good. I think it keeps it fresh. Well, you know? and it, it does, and Robert Davi's great. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. How did you end up getting him? Well, it's funny. I knew Robert. I wasn't friends with him, but I I had met him in New York. Um, in passing, and he's done a ton of work. That and guy. what happened was, we went into pre-production on Maniac Cop Two, and while in pre-production, a legal matter arose. We had a freeze. Uh-huh. We had to shut it down. <gasps> and what happened is, you know, I just was, you know, I'm biting at the bit. I'm ready again. This yeah. was a good script. I, yeah. was, I, right. I really felt, you know, we were moving forward. This was going to be a really good movie. I was excited. So we real, had a much fran- bigger budget than the first. Potential yeah, here. totally. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, we had a much bigger picture than the f- budget than the first one. Right. I, I was really getting jazz. Spiro, we were talking about how we we're going to do this yeah. and that and the other. Really, really getting jazz. And then suddenly we had to stop. And it was like we didn't know what was going to happen. Right. Yeah. There was a rights issue. Anyway, so I I was home, and I would often get calls from my crew. Hey, Bill, how you doing? <laughs> um, when, when do you think we're going to start up again? And I would be like, oh, I don't know. And I, it was sort of like I would be revisiting what I w- didn't want to talk about. Yeah, I wanted right. to be alone. You know, I, I understood that they were loyal, and they were great people, but I really didn't want to talk about it. Yeah, right. So I got an opportunity to escape. Uh, I was offered a, a jury position at a film festival in France. Wow. Oh. Nice. So... Before they could say anything, I said, I'm there. <laughs> and I knew Paris pretty well. I had been there several times. And um, I actually won Best Director for Maniac Cop at, hey, at, at, a, nice. at awesome. a major Paris film festival. It was the big one there. Anyway, so um, I didn't win, win Best Picture, but I won Best Director. Oh, best cool. Picture was uh, the Catherine Bigelow film, Near Dark. Oh, okay. oh yeah. great, great movie. Yeah. Good yeah. company there. So... I'm at the film festival, and I contact the distributor of Maniac Cop, and I said, hey, I'm in France, and, and they said, oh, let's have lunch, let's have lunch, you know? So I'm walking to their office, and their office was off the Champs-Élysées, and I'm walking up the Champs-Élysées, 
and I notice the billboard uh, for License to Kill. Mm-hmm. And I see oh, and right. I see Robert Davi right, is the, is the, vil- is the villain there. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm going, wow, that's great. Robert got the pl- is the villain now in the Bond film, and that's really great. I'm really happy for him. I had seen him in Die Hard, yeah. you know, and you know, I knew I knew he was moving up, you yeah. know, and he was getting a lot of a lot of work, uh, which it wasn't the case when I had met him in New York. Mm-hmm. So I get to the distributor's office, and we're talking about. You know, I'm telling him, you know, we're in pre-production on Maniac Cop 2. I didn't want to go into all the gory details, just that it was going to happen and, right. you know, we were going to start shooting soon. And, of course, the question came up, who's in the movie? And I said, um, Robert Davi. <laughs> Robert Davi, Robert Davi. Oh, they got all excited, Robert Davi. Oh, yes. And so after lunch, I speed back to the hotel <laughs> I called Los Angeles, speak to someone. I said, I got to get a script to Robert Davi. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So Robert Davi was making a movie in, in uh, Brazil at the time. I think it was called Amazonia or something. Mm-hmm. It was with Ray Dawn Chang. And he was in Brazil. They got him a script. Then I'm back in Los Angeles. And I get a, I, 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 we connect Robert Davi. We're connected, I think, by his agent or something. And Robert Davi goes, I like the script. I like the character. But does it have to be called Maniac Cop 2? <laughs> <laughs> now, did he mention a condition that he also had to wear a fedora? How was well, his wardrobe well, decided? Okay. Good, good question. So I said to Robert, I said, look, <laughs> I said, I, I, I understand your position, but that's how the film is being sold. Uh-huh. And I said, that title stays. I said, I want you to be on board. I said, we're going to have a great time. We're going to shoot in New York. That's his hometown, okay. too. Mm-hmm. He was living in Los Angeles. I said, I'll put you up at a really good hotel and we'll have some fun. And, and and we liked each other, mm-hmm. you know. We really did. We kind of, you know, we we bonded. And uh, so when it, you asked about his wardrobe, mm. uh, I said, Robert, you are Robert Ryan in On Dangerous Ground. Okay. Ooh, okay. And so all his wardrobe was based on Robert Ryan in On Dangerous Ground. Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. And he he's later claimed that it was Popeye Doyle, but I said <laughs> <laughs> it just wasn't. He, he, he misspoke. You know, I, said, I think Popeye had like a pork pie yeah. hat. Well, yeah. I, think, I, think he got, yeah. I think he got confused because the one time I described the movie to him as Frankenstein meets the French Connection. I can see. Yeah, so he thought of himself as Popeye. But actually it was Robert Ryan. It was mm-hmm. supposed to be that kind of a moody... You right. know that Noir. moody noirish character. Yeah, smoking. You know. So that's how. Yeah. That's how. That's the story of Robert Davi. But again, again, it's another film where okay, you got a little more money, but still, you went all out with stunts. The there's a set sequence. Pieces. Yeah, there's a sequence that takes place in a prison. Yeah. Where the maniac cop is on fire. Right. Yeah. Brings uh, and, new well, definition a new, to fire. And, and I watch it, and then scene. and then a prisoner gets kind of tossed at him who also catches on fire i mean and they're they're still fighting inside I mean, inside an enclosed space yeah, yeah i mean yeah. i mean bill i was watching this going, oh my god i mean this, it's just another stunt stuff i mean which well you- that took about three days that that one little yeah. section yeah uh took three days to shoot mm-hmm. um i based conceptually it was based on the thing Oh yeah, okay. James okay. Arnett. Oh, yeah. Totally. Right. Oh, yeah. No, well, love it. Comes yeah. in and then he, and yes. then he bursts through the wall. Yes. yes. I mean, that, those were the beats. Sure. That I was right, thinking right. of sure. the door awesome. crashing in. Mm-hmm. He goes on fire. And, you know, yeah. And, and and but I decided we of course we have to take it and amplify it. Yes, of right. course. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what happened. So uh, it, it it is what it is. I mean, we lit the people on fire. They, they were protected. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. Um, it doesn't the, look it though. The, I swear to God. The only thing that really was it kind of interesting thing was um i mean it was very time consuming yeah because with this kind of thing you have to have multiple cameras yeah and you don't go to the stunt people we're ready let's go let's go let's go it's whenever they're ready to go <laughs> right right, right. That, okay we're ready to go give us the you know five ten fifteen minute warning everybody's in position yeah. good Light filmmaker tip you know don't you know, don't yeah. rush don't rush the people who are about to be on fire yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i mean it's just really common sense you don't yeah. do that Anyway, so it was just time consuming. You know, we just had to do it. It took as long as it took to do it. Uh, we couldn't rush it. You know, there were a couple of things that were interesting. I operated the camera on one of the shots that my camera operator uh, didn't want to do, uh-huh. uh, which is where I'm, the camera is inside a cell. Yeah. And it sort of dollies back a little bit mm-hmm. as the monster 
the reaches in yes. to grab the guy. Yes. Uh-huh. And it was all like, it was so enclosed that mm. my cameraman got a little claustrophobic and didn't want to do it. Interesting. Wow. So I shot wow. that. But the, the interesting, one of the interesting things was I wanted Leo Rossi to at least have a tie-in shot mm-hmm. for getting on fire. So yeah. the monster reaches around, grabs his arm, yeah. and then the fire starts to go up his arm. Yeah. And then the camera pans and you see it's Leo Rossi. Mm-hmm. You see yeah. the actor. Like in the real know. shot, right. Yeah, in the shot. You want it all tied together. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you replace him with the stunt guy. Yeah. You know, going, out sure. the, going out the thing. <laughs> Leo didn't want to put his arm on fire. <laughs> he said, I'll only do it if you do it. <laughs> so I had to put my arm on fire. Oh, no. Okay. Right. Wow. Yeah. Did he go okay? That was. But well, yeah. Convinced well, I was him. Him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not right. And then you, you still have car stunts. You have stuff yeah. in the, here. The, the scene where, yeah, Claudia Christian is, is handcuffed yeah. to the wheel of the car, yeah. careening down the. Yeah. Amazing. amazing. Well, did you guys ever see a Jackie Chan movie called Police Story? Oh, yes. oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you remember at the beginning of the film, there's the raid on a shanty town by the police? Mm-hmm. Right. And they're crashing through the, the, the hill the, and right. everything. Yeah. yeah. At one point, during it, a woman is handcuffed to the steering wheel of a car. I thought that car was going to go down the hill. <laughs> okay. Okay. But all it turned out was she was handcuffed to the car. Uh-huh. Okay. To the steering oh, okay. wheel of the so car. Okay. So that was kind of your. All right. So I said, I want to see what I didn't see in Police Story One. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, we contrived a, a, a scene. Mm-hmm. Larry wrote it, but it was a contrived scene to get Claudia Christian handcuffed to the steering wheel of the car. It, and it's so. Da- I mean, it is. It is really dangerous looking. I mean, it's just, well, yeah. the danger there was a couple of there was one moment that was dangerous, which is where it goes through the car goes through the intersection, yeah. and one car hits the front quarter panel, yeah. and another car hits the rear quarter panel. Mm-hmm. While that was while she's and, there, yeah. but she's not dangling. The problem is she's secured to the car. Right. So if one of those cars missed their mark, she couldn't get out of the way. Right, right, right. You see, it's a different thing than being right, that's true. than dangling. Right. So. Yes, and we had protection on her on her free leg, the one that we wanted it to look precariously going yeah. close mm-hmm. to the rear tire. It was wired. You don't see the wire, but it was wired. Right. But still, we were always worried that the wire could snap or something could happen. Right, right, that was right. the only thing that was really a concern. She was not steering the car there was a driver in there oh okay, oh, okay. there was yeah. a driver in the car who was covered okay and you can't see uh, you know that's right, the right. idea you don't see him sure. and so, i didn't see him she yeah. seems like kind of a rough and tumble gal too like she did you, a christian yeah, yeah. not in she, the least no really no. no it was really terrible she, she <laughs> <laughs> no. uh here on monster party yeah, yeah no she was um uh, she was not rough and tumble. No, she not was, at all. Huh? She was a bitch. And, oh, uh, oh, 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 all right. And made our lives miserable. No. Well, that's terrible. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. she, well, she, 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 she was the, the movie. I can't tell you, yeah. but uh, she was one of, like, I can't even, I don't even know if there are two actors I can point to, but she was the only one I ever dealt with in any of my films who was just totally, uh, just total bitch. Wow. wow. Total bitch. Wow. Well, she's great in the movie. You know, yeah, for what it's for what it's know worth. It. And no, no, yeah. no. I had I had no I, no idea. So now Mania Cop two was was a pretty good success though, it was too, a, right? Nineteen ninety. Yeah. Nineteen ninety. It was it was very successful. Right. So you had kind of created this little franchise now. Yes. Right? Okay. It's like why so, not a third one? Yeah. yeah. So now I know there's a lot of controversy with the third one. Yes. I know that as the film is made as it is, when you see it, it's directed by somebody we all kind of know named Alan Smithy. <laughs> yes. Um, so, now, I mean, I know if it's a sore spot with you, but I would it be is, like, Well, it's not a sore spot. It's really, uh, it's, it's a situation where there were too many chefs in the kitchen. Oh. Was this also written by Larry? Or Well, was- what's on the screen is very little of it remains of Larry's script. Really? Yeah. It was a situation... On the first two movies, I was the producer. Mm -hmm. It it says Larry, but Larry wasn't. I was the producer. Right. Mm -hmm. And we were responsible. We did the pictures. They came in on budget. They were, you know, everything. They were successful. Everything was great. But what happened is the company that financed the second sold the rights to another company in America called Overseas Film Group. Mm -hmm. And they were working with a group of producers who were making a lot of films for their company. Okay. Led by a guy by the name of Joel Swasson. Very nice people. Mm -hmm. All very nice. But, you know, you put two people in a room, they're going to have two different points of view. I mean, you know, I... I'll say. No. They could be... Everybody (laughs) could be, you know... Amicable and you know, nobody has to be so true. It's well intended, but different points of view. Yes. And 
<laughs> I'm <Wynell>. suddenly sitting <laughs> there, <laughs> and, and it was like Larry and I, in some odd way, kind of started to feel marginalized. It was these guys' movie. They were in control, and they had the power with the financier. We didn't. We had no power. They had all the juice. Wow. We were well-paid employees. Okay. We were right. very well-paid. But not your vision. It wasn't your vision. Up there. Yeah, it was, it was just like we were making this movie, and I remember one. It, it, this kind of sums it up. Is one of the guys, one of the producers said, look, I live in Santa Monica. None of my friends in Santa Monica watch the Maniac Cop movies. What we want to do, Bill, is make a Maniac Cop film for people who don't see Maniac Cop movies. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> so in other words, right. your audience, you're not going to try to go with your audience. You're going to... You know... What he said in his own way, it makes sense what he was saying. What he was trying to say is, we want to take this out of the niche okay. and right. broaden it to a bigger audience. Okay. And so everything became a struggle. It became a conventionalized. It became, yeah. as an example, Larry's script was written for a black detective, not for Robert Davi. Mm. Robert Davi was he not. Returns, was, his character, his his character was not in the movie okay. at all. It was a black detective, and we had cast a very, very good actor mm -hmm. to play the role. In fact, I did the casting right over here at near Radford Studios, mm -hmm. right near here. Um, Can you say who that actor was? Uh, you know, I forget his name right now, uh -huh. but he was in Daylight. He was in a Jaw, one of the Jaws films, I think Jaws 3 okay. or something. He was really- Samuel a, L. Jackson? No, it wasn't no. Samuel L. <laughs> Jackson. But a very, very, very good actor. Mm. Very interesting. Right. And the story itself was interesting. It took place. Uh, yeah, yeah. It took place in Harlem. Mm -hmm. That's where the movie took place, mm -hmm. and it was supposed to be where this detective, in so dealing with the supernatural character, is confronting his childhood of being grown up in a household that practiced voodoo. Mm -hmm. So we had all these interesting elements involved of going and getting into the Harlem world, which really exists. Mm -hmm. The Harlem voodoo world, the Santeria world, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff, you know, that this character would be getting involved with. And, you know, there's traces of that in the film, but it doesn't even make any sense. Right, it, right. it just it's comes out of nowhere. Disparate. Yeah, It comes out of nowhere. So that we had this thing where the financiers were not able to get a commitment from one of the biggest financial components to the Maniac Cop series, and that was Japan. And it was believed, and and turned out to be true, that they were not committed because of having a black lead. Oh, oh. really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And Jeez. it's still that way in Japan. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. And yeah. across, in a lot of uh, international markets, too, that is a mm. problem. Mm. Okay. Yeah. But but you're still on board here. You're at the when as the start of it. Uh, yeah, yeah no, you're I'm still on, on board. I'm on board, but I'm starting to see what are we going to do? Yeah. And, and when the financiers say, "Well, what if Robert Davi comes back?" They they say, "We're on board." You know, and that was a big chunk of the financing. Mm -hmm. You know, the movie was made I think it was 3 or 3 and a half million and mm -hmm. Japan I think was like 800,000. Mm -hmm. So you're not talking about chump change. No, you're talking right, about right, real no. money. And so the idea was to write out this detective and mm -hmm. write in a Robert Davi. Right, mm -hmm. right. And when that was accomplished, we had a script that was maybe just over 60 pages, 70 mm -hmm. pages, oh, something wow. like that. It was a really cut down script. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, you know, we're moving closer to pre-production. We're clo No, we're in pre-production. We're closer to production. And we're kind of making up this movie as we're going along because we have to fill it out to yeah. be a 90-minute movie. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's no 90 minutes mm -hmm. anymore. And it just became like all the stress and, you know, versus when you're making a Maniac Cop 1 or 2, it was just putting the pieces together of this puzzle mm -hmm. that you already had the picture in your mind. Right. I'm making a movie. I don't know what the hell I'm making. Really? Right. I'm, I'm sitting there going, what am I doing? What's going on? What scene? How does this fit here? And there can't be any harder experience then when you're going through something like that where it's a real mess mm -hmm, and right. you're trying to make sense of it. Right. And that mess led to a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. And Joel Swasson was kind of coming in and and writing because Larry gave up at this. Larry, oh, really? Larry, you know, Larry is not a team player in that he'll throw me under the bus if he could. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. He said, look, I've been paid. I delivered a script. Yeah. No one said the script was bad. You're asking me now to write a new script 
Right, right. And I'm not going to write a new script without getting paid for a new script. Mm-hmm. Right. That was Larry's position. You can't blame him. No. I mean, right, it's right. not like me. I'm directing a movie and they're asking me to redirect. They told me, okay, you're not going to make a new movie, right, right. You know, but, but we're not going to pay you anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. Larry said, I wrote a script. Everyone liked it. You know, it was a good script. Now right. I'm not going to write another script. Mm-hmm. You want me to revise the other script? I'll revise it. I'll make some changes, but I'm not going to start from scratch. Right. Put in all new characters. Right, right. I'd have to come up with a whole new situation. That's just not going to happen. Right. So it became Let's Wing It. And oh. and uh, yeah. and it's Joel Swasson. And then, of course, Robert Davi got to, you know, he, had, he realized he had some power because of the financing chunk of it came in because of his involvement. Oh, right. right. And it became just, uh, it just became a nightmare. It mm. really did. And I... I really just I, I tuned out. It was like I was I wasn't I was there, but I wasn't really. I, I will argue though that because I've you know seen the movie and it's not at least for me it's not an embarrassing train wreck of a movie. There are still some cool elements in there. The idea that it's I think uh, Larry Cohn even mentioned I think it's a little bit of a Bride of Frankenstein idea because you have the female cop who's in, in a coma and she was put there wrongly and. And so it's like the maniac cop is kind of like wants a girlfriend. So he's kind of like <laughs> feels for her. So yeah. he had that kind of yeah. element in there, which is not bad. And there are some great stunts in this movie, too. Well, I, I will tell you that unlike the other films, the entire fire scene with the cop, Spiro directed it in its entirety. I, oh, I wow. was never there. Wow. Really? Yeah. yeah. Basically, he went out with the crew and he was given... But, you know, I knew Spiro really well. Yeah, I, right, he, right. But, you know, we talked about the beats. But at the end of the day, it was totally him. Right. This is like a car chase where this time the maniac cop yeah. is driving a car while completely on fire. Yeah. <laughs> and like, yeah, it's pretty amazing. It, it, you know, I started it. I ended it. But he, all the middle chunk, all that stuff on the bridge, all that stuff is all Spiro and his team. Right. right. So how much would you say that you is it, you maybe did 75% of it? or? Well, it's funny. The first reel of the movie, yeah. or the first 20 minutes of, or 10 minutes of the film, not one bit of it, except for the flashbacks to the earlier films, <laughs> is mine. Oh. Oh. Every bit of that was directed by Joel Swasson. Okay. Wow. They went out and they had to fill the running time. Oh, right, right. So oh. it's all bullshit footage oh, that they <laughs> To wow. fill out the wow. running time. Uh, even the scene where Davi is on the firing range with her, it was on that day I quit. No. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I came there. Joel had written the scene with Davi, with him and her. And it was just so fucking corny yeah. and stupid. Yeah. And I just looked at it and I said, I can't shoot this shit. Really? I wow. said, I can't shoot it. Guys, why don't you take over? I'm not going to be any good for you. Really? And they did. Wow. You know, what they did. And Joel shot that. He, he directed it. I, I was there at the beginning of the thing, but I didn't direct yeah. any of it. Right. I just left so I could say goodbye and I'll go home. Wow. You, you, you get to that point. You get, you get so defeated. You just yeah. feel like, you know, this is not going anywhere. And that was kind of the end of Maniac for you. Maniac yeah. Cop. Well, it's yeah. not the end of it because we're doing a remake right now. Oh, hey. hey. Is this like, at what stage is this? Is this like just in... No, it's financed. It starts shooting in, in LA this summer. Wow. wow. Fantastic. You, uh, yeah, that's great. Like, like casting yet? Have you kind of decided? Um, well, no. You see, the casting wasn't contingent on the... Fi- no, the finance, it wasn't contingent on casting. So we're, uh, the film is financed. It's financed by a uh, French company, Wild Bunch, who financed the Maniac, co- the Maniac remake with Elijah Wood. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, um, okay. And, uh, and the company called Bold Films, you might have seen their logo at the beginning of movies right uh they're they're financing the film it's uh shooting in in la i'm producing it with nick winding reffin awesome. and uh directed by uh, john himes who did the wonderful universal soldier films the mm-hmm. follow-up oh, sure. yeah. yeah regeneration that's right yeah. the, the new one was pretty yeah. good they yeah. were good yeah, yeah we really liked them nick and i liked them a lot so we we hired john who's a great guy mm-hmm. and it started shooting this summer well, awesome. Bill, that's Amazing. great. That's fantastic. You know, I, I know that uh, there's been a lot it's of It's not talk. really a remake. No, no, no. It's really a reboot or a re-envisioning. Which I, that's better. I, 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 yeah. I get yeah. it. But, you know, it's interesting. We've had filmmakers, directors on come on our show and talk about how challenging it is now a days because, like, a studio really wants to do, you know, everyone wants that big blockbuster and there aren't as many smaller films or niche films made in the independent market as it was back <clears throat> in the heyday, back in the, let's say, the 80s. or, or Where you have that much control yeah, yeah. over well, what you're doing. I think really the difference is back when I started making independent films in the 80s, the theaters were a democracy. That if you 
put up the marketing money, you had a place at the table. Mm -hmm. And you can put your film into theaters and let the chips fall where they are, right, right. for better or for worse. The video market kind of falsely supported the independent market. Mm -hmm. you, you, I'm sure you guys know how many independent films were financed by video companies. Yes. Mm -hmm. That when you went mm -hmm. to see them in theaters, they were terrible. Yes. Yeah. They were right, awful. Right. You wonder where the hell they, you know, they, I, I, I made a couple of those. They weren't so bad, you know, Hit List and sure. Relentless. They were probably, I would say, the better of the bunch. Mm -hmm. I actually like Relentless very much. Well, it, it spawned three sequels. Can you That's right. That? Yeah. All with Leo Rossi doing, know. going after a different yeah. serial killer. Right? <laughs> the funny part about Relentless, it was a, 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 it was a Really, both these films were really easy. Jan Michael Vincent was a drunk, so I had to. Oh. <laughs> yeah, by that point, he was. I think I heard something about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On Hitless, that was the only. Everything else on the film went smoothly except yeah. for Jan Michael I think Vincent. he started drinking on Danger Island. <laughs> <laughs> Relentless, though, was like a vacation. It was like really? so easy and to make. Judd Nelson, very uh, uncharacteristic role for him, and he's great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrific. Yeah. Yeah. James, probably your favorite. It, was, uh, it is. Yeah. It is. And I love the interplay between Leo Rossi and Robert Loggia. Yeah. Both were like transplanted New Yorkers in LA at busting each other's balls all the yeah. time. It's very it's very natural, relaxed. It's funny as hell. We shot all around here. We did a lot of this really? stuff. In fact, the, the house at the end is right near the Whitsitt Golf Course. Wow. It's right near wow. the Whitsitt. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, Relentless was like, you know, again, it, it was one of those things. We had a good script. It was written by uh, Phil Alden Robinson. He's not credited, hmm. uh, but he wrote it. He wrote Field of Dreams. He oh, wrote wow. a lot of, he Jeez. directed very, he's a really accomplished writer. It was originally written for Afco Embassy as a follow-up to Vice Squad. Oh, wow. okay. And we made some changes in the script, but for the most part, it's really Phil Alden Robinson's script. Oh. Even that interplay you talked about was, yeah. was, in, was in that script. And we had a great cast. I mean, Judd Nelson, everybody, Meg Leo, Foster. We, yeah, Meg Foster. We were Leo and I by that point. You know, uh, we we really got along great. We became friends mm. during that movie. Originally, by the way, I wanted to cast, and I and I and he wanted to do it, Joe Pesci. Oh, oh. really? Yeah. Wow. yeah, I can see that. But yeah, I tried to convince. At the time, it was financed by a company called RCA Columbia. And I said, look, I want Joe Pesci to be in the movie. And he had already done Raging Bull. It was yeah. not like he was right, not. Right. And, and they couldn't justify paying him really the same as what they paid Judd Nelson. And I, and I don't, but he's so good. He'll add so much to the movie and all this kind of stuff. This is before my cousin Vinny. Yeah. And, yeah he did okay, you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but Bill, you were saying, so you, you had done those films that were kind of in the video market. Yeah. Had, but then... You were saying that. Well, what I'm saying is this, is that the independent business, believe me, the same words you just said yeah. were said to me 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's always been tough to mm -hmm. raise money to make movies and to get them out there. Mm -hmm. It's always been tough not only to make the movie, but to turn a profit with yeah. the film. Yeah, right. always sure. been. It's always been a challenge. Because to make a movie, you really got to you really got to know what you're doing, mm -hmm. and and or have really good instincts. Mm -hmm. I, I think that when I did Maniac, I, I had really good instincts. Mm -hmm. um, and when I did Vigilante is when I learned. Mm -hmm. right. When it takes 10 years to break even, you learn. Sure. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Uh, and then later, I it smoothed itself out. But what I'm trying to say is, there's a lot of independent films made. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that the threshold to get into making an independent film now is much lower mm -hmm. than it was when we were making them. Mm -hmm. You can go out with a video camera and with a couple of dollars and just shoot anything you want. So the problem is there is so many, so many really bad <laughs> independent films that are made. Mm -hmm. True. You know, it's just, it's just, there's a, glut. Yeah, it's, there's there's a glut of them. Right. It's called Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Even Netflix doesn't buy them anymore. Oh, so yeah, yeah, the, yeah. there's such a glut of mm -hmm. all these really, really God awful movies. But if you are making a movie that can kind of cut through that static, yeah, yeah, there's still a place at the table for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not as maybe as interesting theatrically as it once was. But there's still something. I mean, you still see breakout movies like Goodbye, Mommy. Mm -hmm. you yes, know, yeah. yeah. It didn't, it didn't, oh, Good Night, Mommy, I meant yeah, to say. Yeah. Good I night, know the Mommy. one, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, or you got recently The Witch, or you yeah. have yeah. Yeah. Um, Babadook. Or, Babadook, yeah. or you have right. The Girl Who Walked Home Alone at Night. Right, right. I Amazing. mean, these yeah, movies are made, are made for a modest amount of money, mm -hmm. and they're getting a place at the table. They're getting a place not in a broad way. Mm -hmm. But in a way, where they're getting exposure, yeah, they're getting attention. critical, yeah. they're getting critical acclaim, and they're profitable. Yeah, mm. right. They're profitable movies. So 
the thing is, is it's it's not impossible, and it's it's just you gotta you know really kind of know what you're doing and, and really, really have unique. some talent. Yeah. 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 So, Bill, after maybe like the bad taste in your mouth from Maniac Cop 3, but you did, you did Relentless, you did Hitless, do some other films, but then you kind of got back a little bit more into the horror genre, a little bit more kind of high concept right. horror idea with, with uh, Uncle Sam, mm. 1996, which is kind of a little bit of a Maniac Cop idea in a way. Another great concept. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is kind of like a, a, a very you know, gung-ho, patriotic soldier in Kuwait who very timely. Who we find out it's kind of was also yeah. kind of like a bastard of a guy in home life, but he's like a super like dedicated soldier who's killed by friendly fire, and so his body shipped back to his hometown, and uh, he kind of as a kind of a zombified it comes back to kill all the unpatriotic citizens. Worst <laughs> so, on the Fourth of July. Worst Fourth of July. Which is <laughs> a great idea. Well, look, Uncle Sam was written by Larry many years before we actually made it. Oh really? And okay. he had given it to me, and I just uh, I hadn't I didn't really respond to it. But I was working on a movie, an ill-fated movie, but I got paid, so I guess it's okay. Yeah, uh, a movie I was working in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and I happened to be there during Fourth of July. Now I'm from New York. I lived in Los Angeles. Fourth of July, some fireworks go off. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. You know, we barbecue. And yeah, and some drinks. But, yeah. you know, we don't really have a deep rooted feeling of the flag and all that's right. You know, right. I don't know better or worse, but that's how we, we are. We're sure. Not, we're not, we're, we're kind of oblivious. Hey, you're yeah. New Yorkers. You don't, you don't have or, to wear yeah. a badge. Yeah, so. I, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> So when I'm in Nashville during 4th of July, I'm realizing that there are people that really, it means a lot to them emotionally, 4th of July. Mm -hmm. So I thought back to Larry's script and I started thinking about it. And then I kind of had this idea of, I was a big fan of Twin Peaks. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Uh, I think we all are. And I started thinking that, what if this Uncle Sam movie took place in a town like Twin Peaks? And it was... That's what the movie was. It was kind of Uncle Sam by way of Twin Peaks. Okay. <laughs> so that's where I was. I don't I don't think I accomplished it, but it was where I was headed with it. That right. was my thinking. And again, on that movie, it wasn't nearly as bad as, as Maniac Cop 3, but it kind of was disheartening that here, all these years later, and the success that I had in the genre... I was still burdened with people interfering with the movie. The worst of it was the music. They hired a composer behind my back. I mean, to me, a composer like a DP or, a, or the director of photography or the editor, these are the director's brushes. Yeah. I mean, in your, and, in and your case, uh, you had a relationship with Jay Chatterjee. I did. So I did. Amazing. And Jay, for and you. I would have yeah. loved to have Jay work on it. But it was like, it was, it was, because to me, my movies are musical. Mm -hmm. I, if you notice so many parts of my film, the music takes a front seat. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so I created moments in Uncle Sam for that to occur. So I edit the movie and I shoot it one way and it's then screwed over by a, a composer who really did not have the uh, share my same sensibilities. Yeah. And he just came up with a score. I mean, if you had heard his score that he delivered, you swear you were listening to John Carpenter's Halloween. Really? Yeah. It was note for note no. Halloween. No. Wow. And I couldn't use it, obviously. No. I mean, it was shocking to me. Yeah. If I put that on the movie, I'd be, I'd be tarred and feathered. So the composer had to rewrite his own so we had score. To, so what we had to do <laughs> is... Literally go in with a. We had to pull library music. Oh. We had to piece together a score, hodgepodge, for the movie. Oh my God. And it and when I watch it, it's like horrifying to me how bad it is. I'm watching this movie that could have been a. I, look, there were things in it. I'm not going to say it could ever be a great movie, but it could have been a cohesive film. That I'm watching it, and it's all like, uh, it's like a, a, a hodgepodge, and I can't watch it. It's hard to watch. It's, I mean, to me, I, like, it doesn't quite have the smooth flow, maybe, of your other some of your other films, but there is still some fun stuff in it. And I'm not saying it's a, it's not a disaster, but it could have been a lot better. Well, mm -hmm. I'm still baffled by, and I know that happens Versus, all the time. Versus, by the way, Maniac Cop 3. 
would not have been better based on the things that happened. Right, right, right. With Uncle Sam, it could have been a better movie, even with what we shot, without going back and reshooting anything. Right. Mm-hmm. Could have been a lot better movie. Right. But I'm still mystified by, you know, here you have this pedigree. You have these films that you've done that have been so successful. Why not trust the person right. who was responsible for these successes? Well, you would think I so. I just don't get that. You, you would think so. And logic would tell you, yes, but I've come to learn that we're in a business where everyone involved with the movie wants to piss in the pot. Right. Sure. And that's just the reality. You kind of started doing a lot of um, like documentary features for um, uh, producing for Anchor Bay. Yes. Uh, um, a, a lot of like the behind the scene featurettes and the cast and crews of these horror genre uh-huh. films. And then you went on and actually established your own company, Bloom Underground, which is like. I mean, especially for us. It's a present. It's a, a love letter to us. A haven of like all these fantastic, many like forgotten, rare, hard to find or sci-fi genre exploitation films that may never have seen the light of day if it wasn't for your company. Yeah, right. These lovingly yeah. uh, produced Some examples. DVDs and Blu-rays. Just as examples. Some of the movies you guys have put out. I mean, you put out many of Dario Argento's films, mm-hmm. and fantastic Blu-rays and DVDs, Lucio Fulci's movies, Larry Cohen's. But also, you put out like the Blind Dead films. Aww. You put out the whole set of all the Blind Dead movies by Ar- Armand De Osario. Yeah, which I love um, great packaging too. I love it. Yeah. Shockwaves, yeah. one of my favorite. Shockwaves, 70s. probably one of my favorite horror films of all time. One of my favorite horror. It films? is mine as well. Yeah. Death Dream. Love, love Death, Death Dream. Dream. Oh, love it. The greatest. Um, but, uh, I mean, there's so many. Mark of the Devil, uh, Nightmare City, The Prowler, The Tenth Victim. What well, you know, the fun of Blue Underground. Is that well? One of the things that I did uh, during all my years is I would invite people to my home and show them movies that they had never seen before. Right, mm-hmm. right. Uh, I remember one time uh, Judd Nelson came to my home and I showed him Fight for Your Life. <laughs> or, <laughs> <Right>. you know, <laughs> it would just be that kind of a thing where I would, it was the joy of, of that Ex- time exposing show, people exposing to, people yeah, to right. something they'd never seen before. Yeah. And so I look at Blue Underground. When I started it, I looked at it as exposing people to these movies, these really cool movies. And through my producing films, I made a lot of contacts around the world, Mm -hmm. which I was able to use to acquire the rights to films. Right, right. So that's, that's that's my joy. That's I really, I do enjoy it because you're uh, putting out the stuff that you yourself love, right? Yeah. I mean, like you're, which yeah. is great. Oh yeah, and I would say today it's less interesting because it's such a crowded marketplace today, right? right. And a lot of my competitors who don't spend the money I spend in doing all of the extras and mm-hmm. restoration, mm-hmm. you know, that attention, that criterion esque, yeah, attention right. to we love be, and appreciate. Yeah, and that's that's what a, we go for. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and they go out and spend more money to acquire films uh, because they're not spending it on the production, so they outbid me, mm-hmm. and right, right. Um, and so I'm not going to go and and compete with them. Right. So I've decided I made it. I'm, I've made it a my mission at this point. To if I get if something makes sense, I'll do it. Right. But I'm no longer going to be fighting with people with, with what I call stupid money, right. where people are out there just doing it because their ego is somehow associated with their business. And I think we know people who are like that who, yeah. who right. Twitter and sure. I never Twitter, I never Facebook, I never <laughs> do any of that stuff. These guys though who own some of these video companies, who all they can talk about is them and they and you know right. how they did this and right. and I and I just don't do that. I, I believe that I'm in business to feature the movies. Right. right. I'm right. a right. steward of the movies. I'm not it's not about me. It's about the movies. Right. Well and, and it's, it's always so, about that. It's so great to have somebody Running a company who's also a fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there any uh, titles coming up or any uh, movies, that obscure stuff that you are looking to put out? <laughs> well, you I, that rather, you can talk about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd rather not talk about. Okay, that. okay. okay. But, but for our, for our listeners though, to check out Blue Underground. Blue Underground. I, I yeah, mean, I probably have more Blue Underground. Yeah, than I, got I got a ton. I got a stack. Company, I really do. Yeah. I've got a lot of spaghetti westerns too. Which I mean, it's it's always a joy to find movies you didn't think anybody would release over here in the U.S. Yeah. Beautiful. So, yeah. I was the first one to really give Django a proper release. Yeah, it's beautiful. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, Compañeros. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So other than like other than the the kind of reboot of Maniac Cop, is there other stuff like on the horizon that you're doing? Yeah. Like, what do you uh, plug some stuff? <laughs> 
that you can. That's you can. Uh, well, I don't like plugging stuff until it's solidified. Maniac Cop is solidified. The mm -hmm. contracts That's are signed. Right. The financing is in place, so I feel comfortable talking about it. it. Was also, by the way, it's not written by Larry. It's written by you guys may know Ed Brubaker. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. 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 comic book writer. Yeah, uh, oh. extraordinaire. Yeah, Winter cool. Soldier. Yeah. So he, wow, he wrote, awesome. He, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he, so so it shoots it shoots the summer and and we hope to see this. This will be like in. Uh, 2017 maybe uh, or you know it's up to the movie gods sure <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, to, I, to my, look out yes, for this my guess is you'll probably see it sometime in 2017 and uh i hope to at least get a couple of film festivals because i love going to like places like spain and <laughs> yeah. you know right right and uh because i got to do that with the maniac remake the elijah wood one I had a lot of fun traveling with that. So wow, cool. I'd cool. like to get some travel time with this one. Uh, Bill, Bill <laughs> 2017. Before we wind down, I, I want to uh, circle back to Joe Spinell. Yes. Because you knew him well. Yes. And, uh, you know, I've, I've read about how he passed away, mm -hmm. and it was very sad, but it, it seemed like it was accidental, but it also seemed like he didn't really go out of his way to get medical attention. And well, look, Joe, no one actually was there mm -hmm. when Joe died. Everything is speculation. Mm -hmm. Joe was a alcoholic drug addict. Okay. Sad, but true. That night, he was at a bar in Queens, and he had drank to excess and got into a fight with someone. Mm -hmm. We don't know if that was the cause, or he somehow, he was a hemophiliac. Right. Uh, oh. Or somehow he fell from being drunk, or maybe a combination of drunk and the fight, you know, where... Maybe he was not didn't have all his coordination, but he he um, he bled out in his living room. Mm. Oh. Now the humorous part of it was that the severed head that was the prop used at the end of Maniac. Yes, he kept on his kitchen table. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the Joe head would have, of himself. Yes. Oh no. So oh, the. So you have a body dead in the living room, blood all over, and you have this what, what appears to be a severed head sitting on a kitchen oh table, gosh. and the police come in, oh, no. and, oh, and I wish I could have seen the look on their face. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I know Joe's sense of humor. Yeah. He would have appreciated it. Oh, my it. God, yes. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Great. A little like life imitating art. Yeah. 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 Wow. yeah. Well, Bill, uh, this has been fantastic. Oh my God! So thank you man. so much. Uh, yeah, really, we're, we're we're huge fans of you and your work, and we love your movies. And, and we love Blue been, Underground. Yeah, this has been a treat. Really, and really, thank really. you for sharing some stories that aren't really yeah, known to really the general great. public, only yeah. here on Monster Party. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Matt, Sean, Larry, and James. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Yes. What a memory. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully, when uh, after the film comes out, too, maybe we can have you back. Yeah, 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 yeah this absolutely. is painless, we right? Love that. Sure. Yeah. Cool. cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Studio City, it's right near where I live. Not far. Gotta love that. And let's take a moment to do a listener shout out. Shout okay. out! This right. goes out to yeah. Larry Carney. Larry, Larry Carney. Carney. I remember Larry Carney. I, yeah, he hails from Lapeer, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And um, Larry once had a creature from the Black Lagoon aerator in his aquarium. <gasps> oh, oh, those are rare. Those are rare. Yes, yes, at Penplax. Yeah. Yes. Did, did you have one of those? Yeah, already? I actually have one. Ah, but oh. but I have to say, no, Mint no, in I, box. No, it is not. In a big, oh. No, Matt, 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 no, no, you don't understand. It's so hard to find it mint in the box. You know, and they're yeah, very expensive. But still, mm. yeah. Oh, you well, guys. Larry uh, Carney also uh, says that Daimajin is one of his five favorite monsters. Oh, cool. Um, right there up there with mine. Yeah. <laughs> he says uh, that Monster Party is his only weakness, oh. uh, which we appreciate, although I kind of look at it as maybe a strength. Yes. But, um, <laughs> he says he's really also digging the longer shows and hopes that we keep making them two hours plus. So thank you, Larry. We'll make them That's five hours. Apparently, no, we no, can't no, help it. No, yeah, yeah it's, right. it's true. The, the, the guests that we've had on. I yeah, mean, we have, just, it's been, it's just been yeah, great. Yeah, it's, it's not a choice. It just, uh, it just happens happen. to uh, end up that way. 
But uh, also, we've uh, on want to let listeners know that uh, a lot of you have been asking where they can get Monster Party swag. Oh my gosh, so many people have been asking. That's right. And yes. we finally, my hairdresser, <laughs> we finally got our acting gear. Now we have an eBay store. Yeah, Monster Party oh eBay store. Oh God. yeah, you can buy. I think I think uh, what we're gonna start with is caps, Monster Party caps. So if you're uh, itching for that Monster Party cap, very, it's very well made cap, yes. high quality item. He's not kidding. The and and the stitching, it's like it's like 18,000 yes. individual Thousands. stitches. 18 billion stitches. No, 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 not billion, <laughs> thousand. Ma- made from the hairs of unicorns. <laughs> yeah. No, uh-huh. no, not uh-huh. unicorns. Anyway, it's uh, the name of our eBay store is easy to remember. It's Monster Party Store. All I'm sorry, say that again. <laughs> Monster Party Store, all one word, okay? Cool. Uh, I'm, so, I'm writing, hold on. There you go. Please go on there and um, buy a cap. Yeah, yes. buy a cap, and because if the all caps... The Go well. Slacks, vests. Yeah, I don't know about the slacks. But Rain ponchos. You no, know, but then, you know, you, you buy, know. send a photo of yourself to us. And Car covers. Hopefully we'll post, <laughs> we'll post it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Absolutely. And um, let's remind everybody, you can find us on Facebook and YouTube at Monster Party TV and on Twitter at Monster Party HQ. How do you like that? Awesome. And you've been listening to Monster Party, a presentation of the Fangoria Podcast Network. It's produced by Matt Weinhold and executive produced by Thomas DeFeo and Ken Hanley of Fangoria Entertainment. For press opportunities, advertising inquiries, and information about Monster Party, contact Ken at Fangoria.com. Well, on that note, I am Matt Weinhold. I am Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Stroth. And I'm James Gonis. And I'm William Lustig. Keep America strong. Watch William Lustig Films. And be a maniac monster party listener. (laughs) 